Thank you all for being here. Now, now we're complete. There we go. Uh, let's begin at tab one with uh, approval of the minutes of our August 2016. Properly moved by Mr. McMahon and seconded by Representative Carter. Any uh, questions or changes to be suggested? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed or abstaining? Very well then, the minutes of the August 2016 meeting are approved. Tab two, Dr. Lippard will provide us with the staff update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a very brief staff update this, this meeting. Uh, Senior Research Associate Michael Mount is completing the LEAD Tennessee program this month. Actually, he's completing it today, which is why he's not here today, but he'll be with us tomorrow to do his presentation on the privileged tax report. Uh, Michael's the fourth member of our staff to graduate from the Comprehensive Leadership course for state employees, and this is a, a, a course that's uh, offered by the Department of Human Resources. Mr. Chair. Congratulations. We appreciate him doing that. Um, it almost goes without saying, but I do want to mention that uh, Mayor Waters, for obvious reasons, is not with us today. He is holding down the, the fort in Sevier County. Um, what a tragedy there. Our, our thoughts and prayers have been with him and the people of Sevier County and, and, um, and environs, and um, we will continue to hold them in our, in our thoughts and prayers. Um, We'll, we'll send some special acknowledgement to Larry, but most of us have tried to leave him alone so that he can do the hard work that he's about. The, the state's response has been, has been tremendous, um, and uh, it's been all hands on deck, as everybody knows. Um, there, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of stories to tell, and um, we think about them every hour of every day. So, Godspeed. All right, on that note, um, let's move on then to the big report. Dr. Owen, tab three, this is, this is it. I want to see, yeah, pretty bleary-eyed there. Matt, you've done a great job um, compiling all of this. Dr. Matthew Owen, our senior research associate, this is the Broadband Internet Deployment Availability and Adoption in Tennessee report. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commission. Good afternoon. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the report. The draft report can be found behind tab three uh, in your docket book. Um, and uh, today I'll be submitting the draft. Uh, oh, sorry. Just to kind of set the stage, and I talked to Cliff a little bit beforehand. There's a lot of a very valuable information here. How many recommendations essentially are are set oh, forth? <laughs> uh, well, you, you can find the recommendations. I think I probably lost lost the official count. Uh, but if you can find the recommendations in the memo, uh, they'll be and, and in the front part of the report, uh, they will be bolded and italicized. Uh, so basically, we've got what I think of as the executive summary. It's like the first 16 pages, beginning at page four. Yes. Um, and is the, and but right before. Right before that, we have a shorter memo with bold and italicized. Correct. Just trying to set the stage a little bit because not everybody's <laughs> right. been able to get all the way through this. <laughs> okay. All right. So y there, there should be a memo uh, uh, on page your, three, book, um, uh, behind tab three, and, and that should contain all of the uh, the recommendations mm -hmm. uh, in that memo as well. And again, those are also um, those will also uh, be uh, bolded and italicized to, to draw them to your attention. Uh, and then they're also in that, that front section, the sort of the executive summary of the report, which begins, uh, I believe, on, on page four, page four of the document right. following the table of contents. And okay. So that sort of sets the stage. Go ahead. Thanks for letting me interrupt. Oh, no. That's right. Uh, so the, for, the, for the draft report, uh, which I'm uh, looking forward to uh, hearing your, uh, your comments and to, 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 uh, for your review, um, uh, this was prepared in response to a request from Chairman Mark Norris for a comprehensive study of broadband internet service in Tennessee. Uh, at the Commission's June 2015 meeting, Chairman Norris asked the Commission to study the current status of broadband deployment, availability, and adoption in the state uh, to assess where there are gaps in coverage and recommend ways that Tennessee can increase broadband availability and adoption in the future. Uh, now, a copy of the research questions uh, initially posed by Chairman Norris can be found in Appendix A. And I will say there's also, uh, you should have received uh, in your packet, um, 
the, uh, there's a, a, I guess, separate sort of packet of appendices. Uh, it's in the book? Oh, okay, that is in the book. All right, great. Um, and also, staff's answers to those questions can be found in Appendix B. The Commission's research has found that there are already several government and private initiatives to address broadband access and adoption, uh, supporting the recommendation that Tennessee should focus its efforts on supporting and coordinating these existing initiatives and uh, on addressing any remaining coverage and adoption gaps. While internet service is widely available in Tennessee, it is not always available at speeds high enough to qualify as broadband. Uh, and we heard a little bit about uh, sort of what, what goes into speed, I think, at our January 20, uh, 2016 meeting from the University of Tennessee Joint Institute of Computational Sciences. Uh, but speed varies in part by capacity, which is the amount of data measured in binary units called bits that users can send or receive per second. Now every image, every piece of audio, uh, or every text, every video sent or received gets translated into strings of bits, literally ones and zeros in computer code, uh, so that it can be transmitted over the internet. Uh, while simple emails and text-only web pages may be made up of several thousand bits, feature-length movies and complex uh, images, such as a complex radiological image scan, uh, may be several billion. Uh, now an internet connection's capacity affects the amount of time it takes to send or receive files of varying sizes uh, or uh, access websites, and it also affects the quality of tasks that involve streaming data continuously. So if you think of uh, watching a video or teleconferencing, uh, the capacity of your connection can affect the quality of that service, whether you can get high definition or whether the, the video will, will sort of stutter and buffer. Uh, the minimum capacity necessary to provide broadband capability is 10 megabits per second download, and a megabit is a million bits, and one megabit per second upload. That's enough to access emails or websites. It's enough to download moderately sized files. For example, um, uh, a photo album containing approximately 20 images. It's enough to do that in less than one minute. It's enough to make video or voice calls. Um, and it's also enough to watch high definition videos. So uh, table one on page 28 of your report provides estimates for the amount of time that it would take to perform a variety of different uh, internet tasks and uh, depending on the capacity of a user's connection. I will point out to, to keep in mind uh, when you're looking at that table that the times listed or the estimates listed are for one user performing one task at a time. Multiple users using the same connection simultaneously or uh, one, ind one individual user performing multiple tasks will split a connection's capacity between their tasks and that could affect the amount of time that each task takes. And also when you're looking at that table, uh, please do keep in mind that the file sizes are reported in bytes um, and uh, the connection capacities are reported in bits. One byte is equal to eight bits. So keep that in mind when you're looking down the column of the file sizes that that's, that's actually reported in bytes. So while uh, 10 one connection will support most individual tasks that residential users perform, it's not always enough for all users, and in particular for individuals who perform multiple high-capacity tasks at once, or households uh, where more than one person might be using the internet simultaneously. Similarly, uh, businesses uh, could well require higher capacity uh, internet connections, uh, particularly for upload speeds. Um, the 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload standard for broadband that the Federal Communications Commission adopted in January 2015, therefore, is a better measure of what communities will need to support uh, residential and business users going forward. Um, though large industries, I will say large industries, hospitals, schools, uh, universities, uh, libraries, um, all, all sorts of uh, locations that either have multiple users, using, could have large numbers of users using the internet at once, or might uh, be performing really high capacity tasks. If you think of a hospital trying to transfer a large amount of radiological images, uh, they, they could require even faster connections, really, or even, even higher capacity connections. Now, in addition to capacity, uh, speed is also affected by the amount of time it takes signals to travel uh, from one end of a connection to another, that's, you know, from one user's device to another. You'll often hear this uh, in the sort of the jargon referred to as latency. Uh, this lag between when a signal is sent and received negatively affects tasks that require real-time communication including those like voice calling uh, that only use small amounts of actual data and uh, that can actually render a connection insufficient for these users uses uh, even if it actually has enough capacity to support them. So for example, a lag time of even one fifth of a second can be unacceptable for voice calls according to the calling service Skype. 
Now, broadband is provided over local, regional, national, and international networks made up of a, of a variety of infrastructures, including fiber optic cable, wireless transmitters and receivers, uh, and the same copper wire and coaxial cable originally deployed for telephone and cable television service, respectively. Each of these infrastructures has different physical properties and technical, technical specifications that affect performance, uh, but they are all capable of supporting high-speed internet service. Uh, and you can see uh, in, section, in the section starting around page 31 of the report, I think there's a, a reasonably jargon-free description of these uh, technologies. Um, I'd also like to stress uh, that the, te the technologies capable of providing broadband are continuously evolving. And uh, this is particularly true in terms of wireless delivery. So for example, providers are already working on the next generation of wireless networks and uh, network technologies, uh, which uh, have provided capacities approaching four gigabits per second in testing. Uh, so the next challenge, of course, will be replicating that under real, real world uh, conditions. Uh, another project that's still in, in its experimental phase could result in wireless signals capable of providing multi-gigabit per second capacities being sent along the outside of power lines. Uh, at present, um, so keep in mind this it, technology is evolving, but at present, satellite internet and mobile wireless are not compar comparable substitutes for wireline and fixed wireless broadband, uh, though again, both technologies are improving. Satellite internet in particular, while it does offer users connections of at least uh, 10 megabits per second download and one megabit per second upload, uh, does not yet offer a service that meets the higher 25.3 standard, according to the FCC. Moreover, satellite service also suffers from lag times that can degrade voice calls and other real-time communications uses, uh, primarily because of the distance that signals must travel uh, from the user to the satellite. Uh, in addition to capacity limits and lag time for satellite service, both satellite and mobile wireless service providers restrict the amount of data that subscribers can use relative to similarly priced plans offered by wireline and fixed wireless providers. The typical residential user, uh, residential wireline broadband user, uses approximately 100 gigabytes of data per month, according to one of the major uh, broadband providers. Satellite internet providers uh, report plans with data caps of up to only about 70 gigabytes per month, according to the FCC. Uh, while mobile plans with caps of 100 gigabytes cost approximately $450 per month. Um, so for both satellite and mobile wireless service, subscribers who exceed their data caps uh, may have the capacity of their connections reduced below broadband quality for the rest of their billing cycle, uh, or they typically have the option of purchasing more data. Uh, even mobile wireless providers offering the so-called unlimited data plans uh, do say that the capacities for users may be reduced uh, after they have used approximately 28 gigabytes in one month. Uh, so in contrast, uh, many wireline and fixed wireless providers offer service of at least 25.3 uh, without any data cap for less than $100 per month, and those with caps often offer upwards of 1,000 uh, gigabytes uh, or more for less than, than $100 per month as well. Um, so the current technical limits on satellite service and the lower data, capes, d data caps on both satellite and mobile wireless uh, do make it difficult to treat them as comparable substitutes. Uh, for wire fixed wireless and wireline broadband at the moment. Uh, the, the coverage maps then that we have provided as part of this draft only include uh, wireline and fixed wireless coverage. So when you, when you do look at those maps, keep in mind that they are only showing wireline and fixed wireless coverage in the state. So with that in mind, uh, access to broadband is improving in Tennessee, uh, but coverage is still limited in many rural areas. Uh, approximately 89% of Tennesseans live in census blocks where at least one provider reported offering wireline or fixed wireless service with a capacity of uh, 25.3 or greater, according to data collected by the FCC in December 2015. And I will say the December 2015 data, although it's, it's almost a year old now, is uh, the latest publicly available uh, data that we have. And that was released in September, uh, just sort of a, about a nine month lag. Uh, this is actually an increase of 2% from 2014, and it's also uh, an increase of 7% from 2013, so that, that is improving. Um, uh, moreover, uh, more than 93% of Tennesseans live in census blocks, where at least one provider reported offering wireline service uh, or fixed wireless service with a capacity that meets the 10-1 standard as of December 2015. That's an increase of 4% from 2013. And you can see uh, coverage maps. There's uh, Map 1 is a statewide map that's provided, I think, for the first time on page 45 of your report. It's also reposted later in the document. And uh, for uh, a more granular view, because uh, that, that map's kind of small, 
Uh, if you look in Appendix F, uh, you can see maps that are at, at the, de uh, the development district level for the state, and that shows a bit more detail. Now, as you're looking at that map, please keep in mind that this represents the maximum extent of wireline and fixed wireless broadband coverage as of December 2015. Uh, the data do not say whether everyone in these census blocks has access to service at the reported capacities. Uh, and uh, that's important. For wireline and fixed wireless service, and this is according to the FCC, providers file lists of census blocks in which they can or do offer service to at least one location. But a provider that reports uh, deployment of a particular technology and bandwidth in a census block may not necessarily offer that service everywhere in the block. And that is according to the FCC. That's uh, that for how they collect their data. Now, uh, on the other hand, I do again want to point out uh, the data and the maps um, uh, or the data behind the maps is almost, uh, th they're almost a year old at this point, and so they don't show any expansions of coverage that have occurred in the last year. Rural areas are also still less likely to have access than urban areas. 98% uh, of Tennesseans in urban areas, uh, or in urban areas, live in census blocks where at least one provider reported offering uh, wireline or fixed wireless service with a capacity of 25.3, uh, according to the FCC's 2016 Broadband Progress Report, uh, and that's compared with only 66% of those in rural areas. Overall, if you're looking at how Tennessee ranks nationally, Tennessee ranks 29th in the nation for coverage of at least 25.3, uh, according to that 2016 Broadband Progress Report, and it was fifth uh, among the southeastern states, including the eight states that border it, which I acknowledge doesn't include Missouri, and South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida. Ha hang on just a minute. Jeff, uh, Senator Yarbrough, did you want to comment on that? Okay. Yep. Um, and now I will say, uh, providers report offering mobile wireless service and satellite serv service in almost every census block in the state. Uh, so uh, from the data that we've uh, been able to get, our the 4G mobile coverage is reported, uh, our providers report that uh, in uh, over 98% of the state's census blocks, uh, and those census blocks contain over 99% of the state's population. Uh, rates of broadband adoption. Uh, Lag availability, though they also continue to increase, only 40, uh, excuse me, only 40 percent of households located in census blocks where providers reported offering uh, at least 25.3 broadband service subscribed to that service, according to the FCC's 2016 Broadband Progress Report. Uh, that is an increase of 3 percent from the year before, uh, and Tennessee is tied for 19th out of the 45 states for which the FCC reports adoption data. Uh, it's also second, though, among those 12 southeastern states that I mentioned uh, when, ta when talking about coverage. So broadband has, uh, broadband has become a near economic necessity in the 21st century. Uh, communities without broadband have difficulty attracting and retaining businesses. More than one-third of the businesses that chose to participate in a uh, recent Tennessee Department of Economic and Community Development survey said that broadband was essential for selecting their location, and more than half said it was essential for remaining in their current location. Broadband availability is also a necessity in the site selection process for many businesses, many large industries, according to economic development professionals that staff interviewed as part of the project. Uh, and almost 45% of development agencies that participated in ECD's survey also said uh, that businesses either frequently or occasionally uh, chose not to locate in their communities because of insufficient broadband. Um, broadband also improves access to quality education uh, and healthcare and is increasingly important for modern agriculture. School work is increasingly moving online, requiring students to have reliable, high-speed connections to complete assignments and conduct research, and broadband will only become more important as the state moves toward educational models that emphasize personalized instruction and learning. Access to video lectures and the ability to participate remotely in classroom discussions creates educational opportunities for students whose schools uh, cannot otherwise afford additional staff to teach advanced courses. And distance learning also benefits many working adults and those who cannot travel uh, by increasing access to Tennessee's colleges and universities as well as post-secondary programs in other states. Patients and healthcare professionals both benefit from broadband's use as well. Uh, video consultations improve access to specialists, particularly in, in communities located far from major hospitals, saving patients time and expense related to travel. Remote monitoring of patients can help doctors and nurses diagnose problems earlier adjust medi medications and prevent readmission to hospital, uh, and more uh, over broadband facilitates the use of a lot of electronic health records, which can help doctors and nurses efficiently access and manage patient information. Uh, as the number of devices that are connected to the internet increases, the need for reliable high-speed connections is only going to grow, and as the commission heard, 
uh, from the Tennessee Farm Bureau in their presentation in our October 2015 panel, uh, this is especially true in agriculture, uh, where increased connectivity allows farmers to collect vast amounts of information about the nutrient uh, content of their soil, water quality, uh, daily temperature changes, uh, and they can analyze all this to help maximize crop yields. And broadband, at least according to the Tennessee Farm Bureau, is, is enabling the kind of data collection and analysis that's becoming increasingly necessary for, par for farmers to remain uh, competitive, especially in global agriculture markets. So what needs to be addressed? Uh, now, I've, as I've mentioned above, only 40% of households located in census blocks where providers reported offering at least uh, broadband of at least 25 megabits download and three megabits per second upload subscribe to the service. Uh, that percentage is increasing, but it still leaves a significant gap. Now, whether individuals uh, adopt broadband service is, uh, from our research, is a function of value and affordability. Uh, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration uh, released a really useful report for understanding many of the barriers to adoption in 2013, and it titled their, uh, they titled it their Broadband Adoption Toolkit. Um, and, it, and in that toolkit, aside from availability, which I'll come back to, the, the main reasons why individuals don't, adrop, uh, don't adopt broadband uh, really boils down to the two factors that I mentioned uh, previously, uh, value and affordability. So uh, in terms of value, perceived lack of relevance uh, and perceived lack of personal skill both affect whether individuals uh, value broadband enough to use and subscribe to a service. More than half of respondents in a 2013 uh, survey by the Pew Research Center uh, found that a lack of perceived value tends to be more important than cost. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, let me there we go. Uh, the side of the lack of relevance or skill is a primary reason for not using internet. And now a similar survey, uh, a 2015 Pew survey, found that the lack of perceived value also tends to be more important than cost as a barrier to home broadband adoption for so-called hard-to-reach adopters. And the survey defined those as, uh, as those who have never had home broadband before and those who say they have no interest in adopting it. Uh, perceived value, of course, is not the only barrier to broadband adoption. Um, both the cost of service and the cost of devices are also often cited as reasons for not subscribing. That's especially true for those with uh, lower household incomes. Pew's 2015 survey that I mentioned above uh, found that 43% of respondents without broadband at home said either that the service or, a, or their devices, their computer, was too expensive. Uh, and that's 33% said service and 10% uh, uh, said devices. Uh, and approximately 81% of respondents with incomes below 30,000 per year uh, who chose to participate in ECB's survey said that affordability was a major concern when selecting their provider. So the good news uh, is that Tennessee already has several public and private resources available for improving digital literacy uh, and reducing the cost of devices and service. Libraries and schools provide access to training as well as service and devices for those who cannot afford their own. And discount programs for broadband service are also available uh, both from internet providers uh, as well as there are uh, several federal programs um, uh, available uh, for those populations as well. So based on these existing resources, uh, the report makes several draft recommendations to encourage more Tennesseans to adopt service. Uh, now local schools, I'll start with schools. Local schools uh, are one of the state's resources, of course, for improving digital literacy. And uh, we've heard, um, Commission has heard on multiple occasions from Cliff Lloyd, the Chief Information Officer for the Tennessee Department of Education, uh, and he's uh, presented, as I said, multiple times on this topic. Uh, so I'll, I'll just restate uh, for the record some of the things that he's highlighted for us and for staff. Uh, the Tennessee Department of Education is currently considering a partnership with Microsoft to develop, a digital, liter to develop digital literacy training resources that will be available for free to every high school student in the state. Uh, these resources would include instruction on using the Microsoft Office suite of products, uh, as well as developing and writing computer code. And the, co the cost to the state of this initiative uh, would be approximately $440,000 per year, and that's according to our discussions with the Tennessee Department of Education. Uh, moreover, as instructions and assignments are moving online, the need for every student in a classroom to have a broadband enabled device increases as well. Uh, but purchasing new or replacing existing devices has traditionally been cost prohibitive for many schools. So to help overcome this barrier, uh, the Tennessee Department of Education is in the process of finalizing a purchasing model uh, that will allow, and uh, this is, they've been in talks, I believe, with the Tennessee Comptroller of the Treasury uh, on this. Um, and this purchasing model would allow schools to lease devices 
for approximately $5 per student per month. And the devices will be replaced every three years. So uh, vendors who, are part of the, who would be part of the program uh, must agree to the program's basic criteria regarding leasing uh, and replacing the devices. And several leading vendors have already expressed interest in participating. Um, districts that choose to work with an approved vendor will not be subject to the state's restriction against making multi-year budget commitments uh, in terms of their participation in this program. Uh, this will allow them to obtain more devices and make those devices available to students to be taken home. Tennessee's local libraries are another existing resource uh, and that, are, that is well positioned to help residents improve their digital literacy skills and learn about the ways that they can benefit from broadband. Uh, the experience of the State Library and Archives is that when libraries offer digital literacy classes, people do come in large numbers. Uh, the Tennessee State Library and Archives, in partnership uh, with the Department of Economic and Community Development uh, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, provided 60 hours of training in each of 70 libraries uh, th uh, throughout the state from June 2010 to June 2012. And more than 13,000 people have attended those sessions. Uh, the state provided approximately $2,400 in funding to each library to help pay instructors for offering the training sessions. And so that worked out to approximately $40 uh, per instructor per class. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they, didn't, they did not collect data about uh, how many people then uh, went on to adopt broadband service after attending these classes. The Tennessee State Library and Archives continues to encourage the state's local libraries to offer digital literacy training regularly to patrons. Uh, the, ten, uh, the State Library and Archives has adopted voluntary technology guidelines for libraries in the state's regional library system uh, that call for all libraries serving at least 5,000 patrons to offer meeting space and devices to community organizations for digital literacy training. Uh, and libraries are also encouraged to provide digital literacy training several times a year, depending on size, ranging from once per quarter for smaller libraries to twice per month for uh, larger libraries. Now, although these guidelines are voluntary, uh, approximately 75% of libraries serving at least 5,000 patrons currently meet them, according to the State Library and Archives. Uh, further, there are uh, 18 libraries throughout the state, and we heard about this from uh, the State Library, uh, the State Archivist, uh, Chuck Sherrill, at our uh, August meetings. 18 libraries throughout the state are addressing the affordability gap in their communities by lending hotspot devices that allow patrons to uh, access wireless broadband. These programs provide uh, patrons with service when they most need it, such as when they're, you know, students are working on a project for school or uh, for business needs or after they have uh, already exceeded their data cap for their own mobile wireless service. Providers are offering these hotspot devices to libraries at no cost for the device itself, and service plans for the devices are costing the libraries approximately $32 per device per month. So one option available to the state uh, then for supporting broadband adoption uh, would be to increase funding so that all libraries meet uh, the Tennessee State Libraries uh, and Archives guidelines, uh, which would improve access to digital literacy resources in communities throughout the state. Uh, according to the uh, State Library and Archives, ensuring that all libraries, including those that are not part of the regional library system, uh, so that would include also the four major urbans, uh, ensuring that they meet the guidelines would cost approximately $144,640 per year. And expanding the hotspot lending program would also encourage uh, more individual individuals to use broadband, both uh, uh, by increasing their access to service that they could not otherwise afford on their own. So in addition to these resources, there are uh, also several broadband disc discount programs that either are or will soon be available to low-income households. Uh, many broadband providers already offer their own discount programs, and eligibility for these programs varies by provider. But participants typically receive broadband that meets the minimum 10, one, uh, 10 megabits per second download, 1 megabit per second upload requirements, and uh, they cost approximately $10 per month. Back on the on the previous point. Oh, sorry. Yes. No. Um, about libraries, ensuring that libraries meet TSLA's guidelines would cost one hundred and forty-four thousand six forty. But then, in addition, expanding the hotspot lending program. Correct. The hotspot lending program is not included. In that. In that. That any, is correct. Any. Uh, estimate of the cost there. Well, you're looking at it, so it would depend on how many devices. Uh, I can I can look into exactly how many devices the average library uh, has as part of this program. I think it'd be helpful in the final report. I mean, b if you're not carefully reading over that, it it, it looks like it's all inclusive, right. but it's really separate. Yeah, that is 
that's certainly something that we can put in to help distinguish that in the report. Because yeah, that, those are two separate, separate numbers. So in addition uh, to the broadband providers that are current, so for the, for the broadband providers that are currently offering their own discount programs, typically as part of these programs as well, uh, they're also offering digital literacy training or access to digital literacy training resources. And uh, many of them also are offering device discounts to program participants as well. The Federal Communications Commission will also expand its Lifeline program. And in fact, since it's December, it, it already has expanded its Lifeline program uh, from mobile and wireline telephone service to include broadband uh, beginning in December 2016. Participants in the Lifeline program receive a uh, $9.25 per month discount. And providers, we heard, um, from Dr. Weiss at our August 2016 meeting. Providers in the Lifeline program uh, for telephone service have uh, traditionally offered participants a free device as part of that program. So it remains to be seen how that program will be carried out for broadband, but uh, potential is that uh, participants would also uh, receive a device or some sort of discount on a device uh, from providers that are participating in it. The Federal Healthcare Connect Fund subsidizes 65% of the cost of broadband infrastructure and service for public and nonprofit healthcare providers in rural areas. Rural healthcare providers rely on this federal funding to defray the cost of broadband service necessary for their telemedicine programs uh, and for managing electronic health records. Now, similar to that, and we, we heard uh, quite a bit about the E-rate program uh, from uh, Cliff Lloyd and from uh, Chuck Sherrill at the, at the August meeting, but that E-rate program uh, provides subsidized broadband service to schools and libraries throughout the state. Uh, the program subsidies uh, cover up to 90% of the cost of service. Uh, but one of the things that uh, Cliff Lloyd mentioned uh, to the commission during his presentation is that the application process for E-rate uh, can be cumbersome and the Department of um, Education last year established a consortium to help schools uh, that wish to participate in it with their competitive bidding process for E-rate. Uh, so while 50 schools in the dis in school districts in the state were denied funding in 2015, before uh, the development of this consortium, all of the state school districts received E-rate funding in 2016, which was the first year uh, that that consortium was in place. Um, now, uh, it also helped reduce the cost of broadband for school districts in Tennessee, and cost, according to uh, the state library and archives, even with E-rate funding, is one of the main barriers uh, to the state's libraries in obtaining uh, broadband service. Uh, so another option for the state could be that uh, the uh, t Department of Education and the Tennessee State Library and Archives can continue or should continue to work with schools and libraries to help them maximize the state's use of E-rate funding. Uh, and I would, again, stress that uh, to a certain extent, this is already taking place. The Department of Education is already uh, doing this and, and the State Library and Archives is already working uh, to do this as well uh, to help maximize the state's use of E-rate funding to ensure that all schools and libraries have broadband. And they can also uh, explore options to better educate uh, these uh, local schools and districts about the funds and the application process and to better assist them administratively in, compete in completing applications. So as community anchor institutions, schools and libraries really are vital resources uh, that facilitate broadband use by making service available both to uh, students and community members who aren't able to afford it on their own. Now, in terms of specific programs for encouraging adoption, uh, most are local uh, and typically they offer uh, training, uh, service discounts, uh, device discounts, or some combination thereof. Uh, several successful programs uh, that we found through our research uh, include the Tech Goes Home uh, program that began in Boston and the Anytime Access for All and Connect Home initiatives in Nashville. And these uh, have combined digital literacy training resources uh, with service discounts and device subsidies to help maximize their effectiveness. And both of those programs have condition service uh, discounts and device subsidies on the completion of a set amount of training. So after a, a set number of classes or a, a set number of hours of training, participants are then eligible to receive the service discount uh, or the device discount. Uh, but I also say that uh, evidence suggests that it's, it's more important uh, than sort of any one program. It's more important to develop programs that target specific populations and their needs, uh, such as elder as the elderly or families with school children. children. Um, so uh, an option it could be that the state, through the coordinated efforts of its existing agencies, uh, including the uh, Department of Economic and Community Development, uh, the Department of Education, and the regional development districts, uh, as well as existing local assistance resources, including the Municipal Technical Advisory Service and the County Technical Assistance Service, 
uh, should encourage and assist local governments in establishing targeted broadband adoption programs uh, that can combine training and funding. Senator Yarbrough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And <coughs> I'm not sure if there's much, uh, I, I guess w one of my questions is how much is the, the, the investment in program to, to sort of achieve those adoption programs? Because when you look at just the numbers in, your, in the report, adoption looks to be an area of truly kind of low-hanging fruit, right? Um, I mean, so right now, basically 90% of Tennessee has access and 40% adoption rate. So there's like 36% mm -hmm. of the people. If you, Let's assume that we build up the infrastructure to be 100%. If we don't change the adoption rate, we're only changing usage by about four points. Whereas if you change the adoption rate, you're having a much, it's a much bigger lever and we've got a lot sort of more uh, penetration can be achieved, presumably for a, 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 a more cost efficient investment on the, on, on the government side. Is well, that fair? Uh, that, that is something that's, uh, the, there's a study um, by uh, two professors from the uh, New York University Law School um, Oh, uh, Charles Davidson and uh, Michael Santorelli. Um, and this is actually a, a separate study from one of their other studies that we've quoted in their report, but uh, they did a study on adoption programs, and that is what they found that uh, in terms of government resources, that uh, can be give you sort of the most bang for your buck, so to speak, is uh, uh, adoption programs. And I think what our research has found, too, is that there, there are, with the resources that are already available in the state uh, or that are can be supported in the state from the local libraries and the schools, that this is an area that um, certainly could could bear fruit, I think. Uh, thanks, and I, I mean, Mr. Chairman, I just thought it was worth sort of, there, there's a, a really significant economic difference in those two things, and it might not be, when we think of uh, broadband access, I think our first thought is making sure that 100% of the land mass is, is covered, but at the end of the day, uh, having, having 50 and 60% of Tennesseans being able to actually use this is probably, uh, an important goal as well, and and it might be one that that's that at least has some cost advantage for us mm -hmm. in pursuing. Dr. Lipper, uh, and I think that's a, a very good point. It's one that we've we've also have, have noticed in our in our own research, and, and I think one of the, the things we found is there are already a lot of existing programs out there, both through, for example, uh, we heard from Metro Nashville about mm -hmm. their program at our at our last meeting. Uh, and a number of nonprofit organizations that also offer these kinds of programs, and the providers themselves also offer uh, discount programs that can be used in combination to these things. So, what I think what uh, Dr. Owen is, is getting at here, and it might help to reiterate the point, mm -hmm. that um, by helping leverage these resources and coordinate them, uh, we can get more bang out of it. But there, it's not like there's nothing out there being done right now. It's just a matter of coordinating those efforts. Do we have those? <coughs> listed in the appendix anywhere. I was looking here to see, it, it, have we sort of done an inventory of, of the various adoption programs that exist? Well, I can't say that we have an exhaustive <laughs> no, list, uh, but exhaustive we do have a list uh, in Appendix B, um, I believe uh, there are a, a list of, uh, <laughs> of um, the adoption programs that we've taken a look at, both in Tennessee uh, and in other states. There are, there are several that follow a similar model uh, to what Nashville uh, is uh, currently um, using. I think uh, Chattanooga actually actually as well also has uh, recently instituted a, a Tech Goes Home program. Um, so there are several based on that as well. Um, I see some from the other states, I guess, but have, have we itemized what exists in Tennessee? I, no, I cannot, uh, we don't have necessarily have an itemized list of exactly that everything that's in Tennessee. That might be that would be a good for the final draft to just have a list, because uh, Again, a lot of people don't know these things are out there. They don't know what they don't know. But if there's a, an inventory, to the extent it's possible without, you know, stringing this thing out forever. But I think it'd be helpful for people to be able to see that. My goodness, you know, that this community has 10 programs. I've never heard of them, but how would you know? Right, and I, and I will say too. I think we heard uh, from uh, uh, Michael Ramage too at our at our August meeting of Connected uh, Tennessee's work uh, when they were uh, when they had funding. There, uh, they were also working with local governments in part to help them look at what their adoption resources were and to help design action plans um, to to address adoption in those communities as well. And again, for those listening, we had a presentation from the the former uh, director of former Connected director, Tennessee. Yes. But tell us again what what became of that program. 
a lot of people don't even look well. So uh, and Connect to Tennessee, I believe, began in uh, 2007. It's a it's a nonprofit, uh, or uh, well, it still technically is a nonprofit organization, uh, and, it, and it was involved also in mapping. So uh, initially, a lot of the um, coverage data and mapping um, uh, nonprofit organizations like Connect to Tennessee helped to collect that for the FCC initially. So that was one of their um, initial functions. But what they also did is they also uh, worked with. Uh, directly with local communities uh, to create community action plans for technology. And so as part of those plans, uh, adoption was one of the major things that they focused on, uh, as well as availability, f uh, but they also did adoption. And then they also had separate programs. Uh, they had a Computers for Kids program uh, that helped to provide devices uh, to uh, underprivileged children in the state. Uh, and uh, they're also involved in, in several other initiatives, I think. And they're no longer involved because? Well, and they're no longer involved, sorry. <laughs> the long way of getting to the point uh, is that uh, their funding uh, was through the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act, at least part of it was. It was federal funding, and so that has since lapsed. Um, and so uh, to become more active, they would, they would need uh, more funding. Thank you. So I guess are there any other questions on it? I'm about to shift to, to coverage. So are there any other questions on adoption? Uh, would it be easier to take those now, or I can wait till? You know, we've talked about libraries. At, at any time in your research, did you come across courthouses um, as? A well, we, we didn't specifically look at that, uh, but that's something that we can do, I think, in preparation for the final. In our. Um, Juvenile Justice Realignment Task Force, as we've talked about capturing data, classifying data, capturing it, and using data, we've learned that a number of courthouses don't have access to the internet, let alone broadband. I, I was unaware of that, uh, but I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it here. So here we have, I mean, government-owned facilities, you know, from the, the, the judicial branch that apparently is in the dark ages completely, but I, if you'd make a note on mm -hmm. that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Sir Yarbrough. Um, just one additional thought in this is, which, I mean, I think the li this might be closest to the, the library aspect, but in places where it might be infeasible for, or more expensive for us to truly do, uh, you know, county border to county border availability. Are there any programs out there to allow small businesses to sort of do co-work situations or, you know, kind of the, like the, uh, like a, the entrepreneur type center like where there can be numerous small businesses using a similar, a shared T1, share broadband type services? Well, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's a, a shared service. I can think, uh, I, I know uh, the city of Chattanooga, I believe, um, Oh, and I'm going to lose the name of, of what uh, their uh, center is, but I believe it's worked. It's through their libraries, uh, and I believe they have an uh, call it their innovation lab. And I I say that out loud, and I think that's probably wrong. Um, uh, but they do have a center or uh, that is sort of set up for small businesses to be able to come in and make use of resources that they might not otherwise have. It just seems that we might be trying to think about making our libraries sort of small business engine. Mm -hmm. I can check into that. So coverage. Uh, as I mentioned above, broadband availability is also improving in Tennessee uh, at both the 10.1 and 25.3 standards. But like adoption, gaps still remain. So in many unserved and unserved areas, the cost of providing service is greater than the revenue that can be expected from subscribers. Um, as the commission heard from providers um, uh, that are presented on this topic in both May of 2016 and October 2015, Broadband networks have high upfront costs, uh, and low population densities can make it particularly difficult for providers, uh, for providers to recover their costs uh, in many uh, areas in the state. Now, as you might suspect, housing unit density uh, correlates with availability of broadband. So um, the average housing unit density for census blocks where no provider reported offering at least 10-1 service as of December 2015, is 17 housing units per square mile. Uh, now, for census blocks where service of at least 10-1 was reported, uh, but not 25-3, so services, uh, census blocks that sort of fall in between the 10-1 and the 25-3 standard, 
the average uh, housing density is 23 housing units per square mile. But when you look at the average density for those uh, blocks where 25.3 was reported, uh, that average density is actually 127 housing units per square mile. Now, figure one on page 70 of the report uh, provides another way to visualize this relationship uh, between housing unit density and broadband availability. And I apologize if it's not printed in color, it might not show up very well. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, so what we did is we grouped uh, census blocks based on their housing unit densities into 10 groups, ranging from the lowest 10% uh, for housing unit density to the highest 10% for housing unit den uh, density. And for each grouping, uh, we then used the December 2015 coverage data uh, to see the percentage of housing units in each group that were located in blocks where no provider reported service of at least 10, 10 1, uh, where providers reported 10 1 but not 25 3, and where providers reported at least 25 3. Um, so barely half of the households in the lowest 10% of blocks for housing unit density have access to at least uh, uh, service of at least 10 1 um, compared with over 90% in the highest density blocks. So while increasing adoption rates can help providers justify investments uh, to expand coverage uh, by increasing their expected revenue, encouraging adoption alone is unlikely to solve the state's problems. Uh, so with that in mind, the report makes several draft recommendations to increase broadband availability in Tennessee as well. So reducing the cost of expanding networks by funding grants to providers is one option to help increase access to broadband throughout the state. The Federal Communications Commission is already offering grants uh, through its Connect America Fund Phase 2 to three major providers in Tennessee. Uh, this uh, CAF2 program provides multi-year grants to large telephone companies classified as price cap carriers in exchange for commitments to expand coverage of at least 10-1 uh, to a set number of homes and businesses in census blocks where no provider reported offering service of at least three megabits per second download and one megabit per second upload um, as of 2013. Uh, so the FCC determined which blocks would be eligible for funding for each provider, uh, the number of locations that providers must serve in exchange for accepting funding and it also determined the amount of funding that each provider would be offered. Uh, providers had the opportunity to either accept or reject the FCC's funding offer on a state-by-state -state basis, and those providers uh, that accept funding but don't meet build-out requirements uh, can have future funding withheld and may have to pay back past funding as well. Uh, providers have flexibility to choose uh, the technology that they will use to build out their networks as part of this CAF2 program. Uh, although the FCC's funding formula is based on the cost of building fiber to the home service, uh, providers can expand service using different technologies uh, so long as they offer service of at least 10 megabits per second download, one megabit per second upload, uh, with a data cap of at least 150 gigabytes, though in some areas um, it's, there's always a but, in some areas 100 gigabytes is acceptable, um, as long as prices are comparable to wireline service in nearby urban areas. So in Tennessee, they mentioned all three providers that were offered funding through the CAF2 program, AT&T, CenturyLink, and Frontier, accepted uh, their funding offers, and their funding uh, totals approximately $30 million per year uh, for up to seven years uh, for a grand total of $210 million in exchange uh, for expanding coverage um, to a combined total of 93,000 homes and businesses uh, in areas across the state. And if you look at Map two on page 74, uh, that provides a map of the census blocks in the state that are eligible uh, for the use of CAF-2 funds. Dr. Rohn, can you tell us, that looking at that map, w what types of areas those are? are? Are those some of the, the rural areas that are, that are? So they do tend to be uh, rural areas, but these are areas that are within the uh, telephone, the, the traditional incumbent uh, telephone service territories of these major providers, if that makes sense. It may not make sense, so I can <laughs> try It does. I'm just sort of curious, generally speaking, whether, you know, and if so, to what extent this is getting to the 13 percent. Well, and so uh, this, I think, can can make a dent in, 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 in the percentage of or the, um, the remaining households, I guess, that don't have access to service. So. Uh, if you look at, when, we've, when we ran the numbers, there are actually 111,000 households uh, located in census blocks where no provider reported offering the 10-1 service, uh, but that are also not eligible for this CAF-2 program. So that leaves, a, I, that, that gives a sense of, I guess, the, the gap. 111,000, uh, 110, 111,000 111, households. 111,000 yeah. households out of, uh, what, what was the, the total number of houses. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what what the CAF two is 
is it taking a, an 80,000 household bite out of the total or? It's approximately an 80,000 uh, household bite when you look at it. It's, it's difficult to give an exact number just because of some of the um, technical aspects of the CAF 2 program. But when you, when what we did is when you take out the census blocks, uh, there were no provider reported offering 10-1 as of December 2015. Uh, when you take out the census blocks that in that subset that are eligible for CAF 2, you end up with 111,000 households. And so I think there were, if, I re if memory serves, there were approximately 80,000 80, households or housing units located in the um, uh, census blocks that are eligible for CAF 2. Um, sitting on this side of the desk as we listen to you speak, you know, we all try to sort of quantify the, the challenge. And if one of our objectives is to is to deal with availability for the remaining 110,000, and that's a that's an if. But if it is, you know, assuming they would adopt it and use it, um, the question becomes: Is more grant funding through through Title VII, which that that fund that we've never used, we'll talk about that mm -hmm. a little bit. The the um, broadband deployment fund. If we provided more funding, would that would would that further extend the coverage, or is this where we need to bring in the assistance of of co-ops and others to help us get to it. Mm -hmm. Just sort of trying to quantify this and figure out. Right, where <laughs> where, yeah. where we yeah. end up. No, and, and I will say too, be, before we even get to that, I mean, there's, there's also uh, several additional Connect America okay. programs that are that are uh, in the process of being finalized. Yeah, don't so let me divert. Well, no, I, and I, don't, I don't, uh, I think, I, th I hope, if I don't end up covering that question, come back to me on that. Um, so, as I mentioned, so that the CAF two program uh, was uh, provided grants to the large telephone companies classified as price cap carriers. There's a another CAF program uh, that uh, is scheduled to be finalized soon. And actually, I was, I was hoping it would be finalized before the draft came out, but I haven't uh, seen uh, who has accepted uh, service yet through it. But uh, there's a another CAF program um, that will provide grants to tele smaller telephone companies classified as rate of return carriers. Um, and so, to like, like the CAF 2 program, uh, providers will be offered funding in exchange for commitments to expanding coverage to homes and businesses in unserved census blocks. Uh, and if all the eligible providers in Tennessee accept their offers, uh, this alternative Connect America fund model could result in an additional 64,000 homes and businesses uh, receiving broadband in the next 10 years. And then, on top of that, uh, there's also uh, the FCC will award Connect America fund grants uh, for additional census blocks through an auction process uh, that's uh, I don't think it's officially been scheduled yet, but it's anticipated that it will take place within the next year. Uh, and as part of that auction process, the preliminary list of eligible locations for that auction include 13,000 homes and businesses in Tennessee. Sorry to keep interrupting you. No, that's so right. Is it fair to say then that under the FCC heading here, they're gonna, they're gonna, there will ultimately be three options, at least as we know them now, CAF 2, CAF whatever, 2.0. They, they call it the CAF alternative, the Connect America Fund alternative okay, CAF model. CAF yeah. CAF alternative, and then auction? Yes. Okay. Um, and I will say, so to make sure that I'm clear about this, uh, for CAF 2, the providers that were offered funding have already accepted those offers. So right. they are uh, committed to building out to the um, census blocks or to, to the number of set number of locations uh, that they've, they've accepted funding for. Uh, for the alternative model, I have not seen that those offers have been accepted yet. Um, I, I had seen that it was hopefully supposed to be November of this year, but I haven't seen anything publicly available. Um, and again, I'm uh, trying to set the stage a little bit for folks who are saying, boy, I'd, I sure wish, you know, that neighboring city, you know, would just send it out here. They might not say that if, the, if it was going to be done at, at, the, at the taxpayer's expense, if they knew that there were two or three federal programs already on the horizon to provide that type of service, let alone other things that you've covered in the report. But again, I'm just trying to. Correct. And so uh, my hope is especially that if that CAF alternative model gets finalized uh, by the final report, that we can provide a map, that we can add that to the map of the CAF, okay. of the CAF program so that can provide a better sense of which areas are already scheduled to receive federal funding. So all told, those three programs under the FCC may be whittling down, well, we got to 110,000, and then you mentioned another 60,000? Uh, potentially another 64,000 in. So we're down to. So that leaves you down around 50. Okay, it sort of quantifies things a little bit. Um, yeah, and so 
in terms of that, and I'll, I'll get to some of the, the okay. numbers uh, there in a second, because uh, I, I did not, I will say in, in the numbers that are included for the cost estimates, I did not include the CAF, or staff did not include the alternative CAF or the CAF auction in those numbers, simply because they haven't been finalized yet. Yeah, uh, there's some but hypothetical, but I think, there, I think that should be fleshed out a little bit more, okay. and Representative Orgo seeks recognition and is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do we know the requirements, uh, what are the requirements are to receive the CAF funding? For for which program? For, for, for any of them? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, we're sorry. Seeing some, you know, we're hearing, well, we really haven't received any of them yet. Right. So yeah. for, th for the for the CAF 2 program, uh, for that program, uh, providers uh, must offer service at a minimum of 10 megabits per second download, 1 megabit per second upload. Uh, and they must have a minimum data cap uh, for those plans of 150 gigabytes per month um, and with some exceptions. Uh, and they must be offered at prices that are comparable to, ur to neighboring urban areas. Who sets that pricing? So it's, uh, I will have to go back and I f look at the FCC order to get, a s to get a specific answer to that question. Uh, for, the, for the pricing, I think it's something that becomes a, a rebuttable presumption uh, in the sense that uh, if someone complains to the FCC, the FCC will come in and take a look at it. Um, but it's not as if the FCC is setting a price specifically. The requirements require, but okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thanks. As there often is with them. But <laughs> that's all federally funded. I mean, those that's three. Correct. That's federally funded yeah. through a tax on uh, wireline and uh, wireless telephone service uh, through the Universal Service Fund. Okay. Mayor Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Orn, I, I may be misinterpreting this map too, but I see several small rural counties that are not eligible for any of this Connect America fund. Uh, could you explain if that's correct and, and how this is happening? I mean, they it's amazing that Perry and Wayne and four or five or six others don't have any eligibility, thank you. Correct, and so that is uh, partly uh, a function of th that map that we, that we have in the, in the text right now is, is only for the CAF-2 program. Uh, so if those areas are outside of the service territory of one of those three providers from CAF-2, they may well not have 10-1 service reported, but they were not eligible for the CAF-2 program. So that is why they were not included in that map. Uh, so what my hope is that by the final, uh, if we can get a finalized version of the alternative CAF model for rate of return carriers, uh, that those maps uh, will provide a more holistic understanding of uh, the service areas in the state that are set to receive funding through the Connect America program. Uh, but I do apologize, yes, right now mm. those, those maps do not show uh, areas that, that might be eligible for future rounds of CAF um, uh, or, or just because an area is not listed as eligible mm -hmm. for CAF-2 funding, it does not mean that it has coverage. Dr. Owen, and Mayor Burgess, my understanding is so they're, they're not covered, as you point out, under CAF-2, but those are the candidates for alternative, for, for CAF alternative, or maybe auction block, but the alternative. And that area. could well be the case, yes. Yeah. So in terms of, uh, so there are several other states uh, that have tried to fill these gaps as well uh, through their own grant programs, and this, uh, there's a discussion of some of them beginning on page 82 in the report, and others are also discussed in Appendix B. The most successful, the successful of these, including Maine, uh, use a competitive bidding process to choose projects to ensure that state funds maximize coverage in unserved and underserved areas, uh, and Maine's program has resulted in almost 39,000 homes and businesses getting access to broadband since 2007. It's also uh, technology neutral, so providers are not restricted in the technology that they use uh, to, to provide service through the program. Maine funds its program through a, a quarter of a percent tax on telephone service. Um, I'll also mention uh, Minnesota's grant program because it uses a different approach for funding. Uh, Minnesota's program has funded approximately 6,000 home uh, service expansion to 6,000 homes and businesses since 2014. And while Maine funds its program through a tax on telephone service, um, Minnesota relies on, an an, on annual appropriations from the state legislature. So uh, that brings me to uh, Title VII, uh, Tennessee Code Annotated, uh, Section 759.315 already creates a broadband deployment fund for Tennessee, uh, but no funds have been appropriated to it. Uh, the Tennessee Regulatory Authority would be responsible for administering the fund. 
And so an option for Tennessee could be to use that broadband deployment fund uh, to provide competitive grants to unserved uh, areas uh, not already being targeted by Connect America Fund uh, grants. And so I think that would be important to understand uh, for the next subsequent rounds of CAF, which areas are being accepted and which areas aren't being accepted uh, for that. So um, if you assume the worst case scenario and assume that those other rounds of CAF uh, will not be uh, funded or accepted, uh, then to serve the 111,000 households um, that are in census blocks that are not eligible for CAF-2 uh, and where no provider reports service of 10-1 as of uh, December 2015 could cost uh, roughly between $122 million and $554 million. And that is um, uh, based on, uh, we calculated those estimates uh, based on uh, the estimates used in the Department of Economic and Community Developments, uh, uh, one of the reports uh, uh, attached to their survey, uh, as well as we used a, a $5,000 per location estimate for fiber to the home, uh, which was cited by uh, private providers in filings with the FCC. If you use um, the, if you use ECD's slightly lower estimate uh, for fiber to the home service, uh, they estimate uh, approximately $3,840 um, uh, per location as the cost to cover uh, every home in the remaining census block. That, that high-end estimate would be uh, only $426 million. Um, but again, I do want to stress, uh, as the chairman has mentioned, that some of these areas uh, are likely to be served as a result of subse uh, subsequent rounds of Connect America Fund funding. In addition to grants, uh, according to representatives for providers who spoke at TASSER's May 2016 meeting, uh, exempting equipment purchases from Tennessee's sales tax uh, could lower construction costs and uh, thus encourage providers to build out their networks. Uh, providers that are legacy telephone companies also say that they would benefit from having their telecommunications property assessed at the lower commercial rates for property tax purposes, uh, much like legacy cable television companies, uh, which would be the 30% rate for personal property and the 40% rate for real property rather than the higher 55% utility rate. Uh, 22 states and the District of Columbia already don't tax equipment purchases for broadband. Um, five of them simply don't have any state sales tax uh, and the rest exempt broadband equipment purchases uh, from their sales taxes. Exempting broadband equipment purchases from sales taxes would reduce state revenue by approximately uh, $45.5 million per year and would reduce local revenue by approximately $60 million per year, uh, according to the Tennessee Department of Revenue. Um, Tennessee, as I mentioned, is, is also one of only eight states that assess legacy telephone companies at higher rates for property tax purposes uh, than the legacy uh, cable companies, uh, although these companies are partially reimbursed by the state's ad valorem uh, tax reduction fund. Assessing uh, them at the lower rates for property tax purposes would cost local governments more than $16 million uh, per year, according to the Tennessee Comptroller of the Treasury. Um, moreover, uh, neither approach is targeted to increase broadband investment necessarily in unserved and underserved areas. So instead, another option uh, that is available to Tennessee is that it could offer credits against franchise and excise taxes for broadband infrastructure investments uh, and target in those uh, investments or target improvements to unserved and underserved uh, areas of the state by giving larger credits for investments in those unserved and underserved areas. And there's already a model for this in Mississippi. Um, uh, and Mississippi is one of a couple states actually that, that has this model. Uh, uh, Mississippi offers a similar tax credit um, and it provides larger tax credits for investments in regions of the state uh, that are deemed to have lower levels of economic development. Um, and Georgia offers, uh, Georgia offers a similar credit uh, against corporate income taxes. Um, both of these programs are, or at least Mississippi's, Mississippi's in particular is relatively recent, uh, so we have not been able to locate data on whether it's been effective at pushing investment into those areas yet. I believe Mississippi's program uh, just began in, in 2014 or 2015. Um, but as is done with other tax credit programs, such as the low income housing tax credit, uh, the state could cap the amount of credits available statewide per year and use a competitive application process to award those credits to try to push credits into areas um, that are unserved or underserved. So in addition, uh, local governments already have several options for expanding uh, broadband coverage in their jurisdictions uh, in terms of reducing regulator regulatory burdens on providers. Uh, while broadband's classification as jurisdictionally interstate limits 
uh, state's ability to regulate some aspects of service, it still provides state and local governments with flexibility in matters related to zoning uh, and public rights of way. Um, access to rights of way is governed by local permitting processes that can delay projects and increase costs, and zoning regulations effectively prevent wireless infrastructure from being uh, built in certain communi uh, communities, at least according to the Tennessee Wireless Association. We heard from them at our May 2016 meeting. Um, but some restrictions uh, do exist. So as described in a 2011 article in the St. John's Law Review, uh, Section 253 of the Federal Telecommunications Act prohibits any state or local government from interfering with a telecommunications provider's ability to provide service um, unless the state's regulation falls within one of two safe harbor provisions. So the first safe harbor provision allows state and local governments to regulate telecommunications in the public interest as long as such regulations are competitively neutral. Uh, and the second safe harbor provision allows state and local regulations relating to right-of-way management and compensation which are competitively neutral and non-discriminatory. Uh, similarly, state and local zoning authority related to the siting of wireless broadband facilities is not absolute. Uh, according to uh, Jonathan Nuchterlein, a lawyer who specializes in telecommunications law, and Philip Weiser, the former dean of University of Colorado Law School, um, Section 332 of the Federal Telecommunications Act uh, balances the interests of zoning authorities uh, and those of wireless carriers by limiting the substantive basis on which localities can exclude transmission facilities uh, from their particular areas and permitting aggrieved parties to seek review in either federal or state court. Uh, the provision requires localities to base any denial of, of citing request on substantial evidence, which it refers to as an amorphous standard uh, that, as one court explains, requires balancing two considerations. The first uh, is the contribu contribution that the antenna will make uh, to the availability of cell phone service. Uh, the second is the aesthetic or other harm that the antenna will cause. Uh, the unsightliness of the antenna and the adverse effect on the property values that is caused by unsightliness uh, are the most common concerns, but adverse environmental effects are properly considered also, and even safety effects though it notes that uh, fear of adverse health effects from electromagnetic radiation um, is excluded as a factor, uh, but not, for example, concern that the antenna might obstruct vision or topple over in strong winds. Um, so controlling access to rights of way and regulating land use through zoning are vital local government functions, but some communities may find uh, that they can attract private investment to expand coverage by streamlining local regulatory processes. Uh, and so one option for the state uh, could be to assist communities that want to streamline local regulations. Tennessee could, uh, similar to Indiana or Wisconsin, designate communities that adopt a checklist of permitting and zoning procedures as uh, broadband ready communities to signal providers that they have removed uh, barriers to broadband investment. Um, and uh, I will say, uh, Connected Tennessee, with their community technology action plans, uh, it, it wasn't exactly the same sort of type of certification, uh, but they did uh, certify communities that had completed these technology action plans uh, as sort of a signal that the community was, was ready for broadband uh, development. And uh, I believe the Department of Economic and Community Development, it has a similar, it's not, it's not the same thing, it's not a community-wide program, but they do, uh, with their certified sites program, uh, Providers, are, you must have a letter from a provider establishing what service is available uh, for telecommunications and what could reasonably be expected. Uh, but that's sort of a, a type of program that perhaps could be expanded uh, more, or, or, or sort of the type of program or resource that could be available to be expanded on a community-wide level. Um. Yes, sir. Question. Is this what uh, Nashville has done with the Google Fiber in terms of the that, that is a slightly different, so the one touch make, I'll, I'll get to one touch make ready and I, I, I won't pretend to be an expert on all issues of one touch make ready, but uh, I, I will, I will uh, promise you I'm gonna touch on that. <laughs> and say this is slightly different. Um, this would be um, in terms of, um, uh, for example, for if you look at Indiana and Wisconsin's uh, programs, one of the things they do is that uh, uh, to qualify as a broadband ready community, uh, um, a local government would have to adopt uh, an ordinance um, setting up that they can accept all permitting pro permitting applications online. Um, it sets a time limit for processing those uh, applications and sets up a number of other standards um, to, to meet. So that, that's more of, of what uh, the broadband ready process uh, typically looks like. It's, it's slightly different. Um, poll attachments. Poll attachment fees uh, can also affect the ability of providers to expand service in some areas. And uh, uh, part of our report that detail or that deals with poll attachments starts around page 89. Attachment fees for polls owned by for-profit utilities 
are subject to FCC guidelines, uh, so long as a state has not opted out of them, and Tennessee has not. But regardless of whether a state has opted out, uh, attachments on poles owned by nonprofit or government-owned utilities are not subject to the FCC's guidelines, uh, and approximately 80% of uh, the poles in Tennessee are either owned by electric cooperatives or municipal utilities, so they would not fall under the FCC's guidelines. Uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, however, has adopted a new formula for calculating uh, these poll attachment fees in February 2016, uh, and that may nearly double the current median fee charged by utilities and electric cooperatives that TVA serves. And as I mentioned above, this will apply to most of the utility polls in Tennessee. Um, TVA's formula uh, also results in higher poll attachment fees than would be charged under FCC guidelines. So uh, the differences can be several orders of magnitude, and these differences result um, because TVA and the FCC have divergent goals uh, when it comes to regulating poll attachments. Uh, TVA's statutory mandate is to provide its service area with electricity rates that are as low as feasible. And in contrast, the FCC's guidelines for uh, poll attachment fees are based on its goal of promoting consistent cross-industry attachment rates uh, that encourage deployment and adoption of broadband internet access services. Tennessee could attempt to legislate the poll attachment fees charged by municipal utilities and electric cooperatives in the state, uh, but because of TVA's authority to regulate these utilities, uh, Tennessee likely uh, lacks authority to override TVA's formula, at least according to a 2014 opinion of the state's attorney general. Any indication that TVA's formula could be um, beneficially affected if the co-ops were, were paying them? In other words, if you expanded the use, wouldn't that help reduce the cost, supply and demand? Well, um, and I mean, in that situation, the co-ops would be paying for attachments on their own. They'd, they'd be allocating um, costs on their own polls. But you're, well, but the report talks about co-ops partnering with other providers. I mean, I'm just trying to think of a rate structure that if, if you expand access and you increase demand and therefore utilization, that could be beneficial all the way up the line, no pun intended. But <laughs> um, I would, I would we'll, we'll have to look in, we'll have to, dis, uh, we'll have to do further research on okay. that. Um, I, we have not run across uh, that, but we can do further research to see if that would. As I understand it, the TVA has always had the jurisdiction. They just never exercised it until recently. This is the, I believe this is the first time they've officially adopted uh, a poll attachment fee formula, yes. Um, so according to this uh, 2014 opinion by the state's attorney general, uh, Tennessee likely would not be able to enforce uh, any poll attachment regulations that cause municipal utilities or cooperatives to violate the power contracts they sign with TVA uh, or infringe on TVA's authority as the sole rate regulator uh, or the sole regulator of retail electricity rates in its service area. And the opinion, uh, which can be found in full in Appendix M, uh, says that regulation by the state of the rates, terms, and conditions of poll attachments um, of the TVA's distributors is not currently clearly preempted by the TVA Act, provided that state regulation does not affect either those distributors' rates for electric power or their ability to comply with their agreements with TVA. Um, if TVA were to assert its discretionary control over rates and revenues of its distributors in a matter that directly affected poll attachments, uh, regulation by the state would likely be preempted. Um. Mayor Bickers. As, as I listen to your testimony today and, and study the materials, it appears Tennessee is somewhat unique in the, in the large, in what 80% of the electrical service providers are municipally owned or utilities that are given the, the protection of being treated as a governmental function. If the Tennessee legislature were to deem the provision of the sale or, or provision of electrical services to be an inherently commercial activity, as it is in a majority of states, would that not pull the pull those municipalities and the poll attachment issue out of TVA, who's occupied the field as the federal government, because those are municipally owned, primarily entities. All right. So if the state said that is as a matter of statutory. We deem that to be primarily commercial. You are, you are selling a product. 
just like other products were sold. And would that also not solve the issue of this, the limitation on municipalities in providing internet service beyond what they do? Because if they're deemed to be commercial, then they wouldn't be subject to the restriction that says the municipality can only provide internet services within its boundaries. That's just a thought because, you know, it's, it's difficult to appreciate that broadband users in Tennessee clearly are going to pay more for that service because the, the carriers are simply going to pass these increased toll attachment fees on. And so that TVA ruling is clearly going to impact the cost of having broadband at a very time that we're studying how in the world do we get increased usage of it or adoption of it. Looks to me like the TVA policy is acting directly in conflict with what the state's trying to do with adoption and expansion. Uh, yeah, so uh, to the first part of your question, I would, we definitely need to do more research on uh, what the state's ability uh, to, to um, uh, to declare electricity to be a, a commercial service uh, and to, to sort of move in that direction. I, I'm not as well versed in federal law <laughs> uh, on, the, on the electric uh, utility regulation uh, and what TVA's protections are. I know some are written into federal law in terms of its service area, um, both in creating sort of a fence around which TVA cannot expand outside, but then also um, protecting TV, TVA in some aspects uh, within its service area. So. Uh, I, I will have to do more research to come up with a, an answer to that question. And, and to follow up with that, it's clear that TVA's interest is in, in promoting and protecting the t its customers, the people that buy bulk electricity. And, and this regulation clearly reflects they could care less about what the cost is of a broadband. And that's, you know, and I understand why that's TVA's position, but it, but that's all related to the fact that TVA, back when it was created, as I understand this, promoted government-owned utilities providing electrical service, whereas in other parts of the United States, that began as more of a commercial endeavor, and to this day, it's primarily a commercial endeavor. When you go back to the days of Thomas Edison and the whole creation of the electrical grid, most of it was commercial with, you know, and the TVA was the exception that said, we're going to do this as a government function. So that's the reason, because it doesn't appear TVA shares this state's interest in broadband adoption. They certainly do have a different mandate when it comes to the uh, regulation of their utility poles, yes, or the utility poles of their local power company. So uh, other provisions uh, in, in the report uh, that was released alongside its survey results, uh, ECD and its consultants also say that uh, so-called dig once policies uh, can facilitate construction of uh, broadband infrastructure. Uh, dig once policies encourage placement of conduit or fiber optic cable when a trench is already open. Uh, and by coordinating with other city, county, or state capital projects, uh, such as uh, sidewalk improvements, the establishment of trails, uh, implementation of street lighting, road construction, um, other projects, uh, additional conduit can be placed within a trench when other work is being performed in a right, right of way. So this could help prevent having to make multiple cuts um, uh, in a right of way to, to lay more cable. Um, uh, there's a similar provision, although it's not exactly a dig once provision, but there's a similar provision already in Tennessee law, though it really only applies uh, in areas of new construction or property development, according to our talks with TRA staff. Uh, in cases of new construction or property development where utilities are to be placed underground, uh, Tennessee Code Annotated Section 759.310b uh, says that municipalities, uh, counties, and other permitting authorities um, should condition or it requires them to condition the uh, issuance of permits for open trenching on uh, the developer or property owner providing notice to all cable television providers uh, so that they can place their equipment uh, in the trench while it's open. And if notice is not given in those cases, uh, the developer or property owner is responsible for the cost of retrenching. But again, this, this only applies in a, in a limited, uh, narrow subset of, of cases. Um, as uh, 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 Mr. Young uh, brought up the one-touch make-ready uh, policy, uh, in its uh, report that was, again, released alongside its survey results, uh, the Department of Economic and Community Development also says that one-touch make-ready processes can help streamline the expansion of coverage. Uh, traditionally, when a new attacher wants to place its equipment on a utility pole, all existing attachers are notified. 
and move their own equipment one by one to accommodate the new attachment. Uh, a one-touch policy makes ready, uh, one-touch make ready policy allows a pole owner to designate a single contractor to move all existing attachments at once. Uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and Nashville uh, are two cities that have adopted one-touch make ready ordinances, but in both cases, providers have sued to block their enforcement, and, and the cases are still pending in federal court. So it's it can't say for sure how those are going to um, pan out. And I we haven't located another community that already has a one-touch make ready policy to determine whether it was effective. Municipal utilities and electric cooperatives. Uh, so municipalities with electric systems are authorized to provide broadband within their electric service areas by Tennessee Code Annotated, Section 752-601, uh, uh, and 10 currently do so. Morristown and Covington were also selected by the Comptroller's Office to participate in a pilot program under state law that allows them to provide broadband outside of their electric service areas, but within the counties in which they're located. Uh, Morristown currently provides broadband to uh, several communities outside its electric service area, uh, though not throughout the entirety of Hamblin County, uh, and Covington has actually since sold its system. Uh, there have been several recent efforts to eliminate the territorial restriction for all of Tennessee's municipal electric systems. Uh, while most of these have called for legislation at the state level, Chattanooga's municipal electric system, uh, Electric Power Board of Chattanooga, sought the FCC's help overturning the state's law. Uh, EPB petitioned the FCC to preempt Tennessee's territorial restriction in July of 2014 and was joined by the city of Wilson, North Carolina, which sought to overturn that state's uh, territorial restriction, as well as several other of North Carolina's restrictions. The FCC granted both petitions in an order adopted in February 2015, uh, but Tennessee and North Carolina sued to overturn that uh, uh, order in federal court. In August uh, 2016, as we heard uh, at our August meeting, uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit ruled in the state's favor and reversed the FCC's order. Uh, multiple bills and recent legislation sessions of the Tennessee General Assembly have also addressed the state's territorial restriction on municipal providers, uh, including two uh, in the 109th General Assembly, uh, Senate Bill 1134 by Senator Janice Bowling and House Bill 1303 by Representative Kevin Brooks would have removed the territorial restriction entirely. Uh, another bill uh, from the 109th General Assembly, uh, Senate Bill uh, 1990 uh, by Senate Senator Mike Bell and House Bill 1839 by Representative Jeremy Durham would have allowed municipal electric systems to provide broadband outside of their electric service areas, but only in areas not eligible for Connect America Fund support and where no other provider offers service of at least 25-3. Um, proponents of eliminating Tennessee's territorial restrictions say that municipal electric systems uh, can help expand coverage to some unserved and underserved areas of the state if they're authorized to do so. And proponents also say that municipal broadband providers can improve competition in communities that already have broadband if authorized to expand. Uh, currently, 71% of Tennesseans live in census blocks where at least two providers reported offering wireline or fixed wireless coverage of at least 10-1 as of December 2015, uh, but only 23% live in blocks where at least two providers reported offering coverage of at least 25-3. And access to more than two providers is limited uh, for both 10-1 and 25-3 approximately. 13% of Tennesseans live in census blocks where three or more providers reported offering uh, wireline or fixed wireless service that meets the 10-1 uh, definition, and less than 3% live in blocks where three or more providers reported offering 25-3. So you can uh, see those maps on, um, that's maps three and four, which are on page 117 and 118. Senator Yarbrough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, did you do any, uh, does the uh, availability of more than one provider have any uh, correlation with affordability in any of those areas? There is there is anecdotal evidence that uh, the, um, uh, when new providers enter a community that it does uh, lead or it, it can encourage the incumbents to lower their prices. Uh, that is something that has occurred in communities where Google has uh, entered the market uh, outside of Tennessee as well. Um, and that is also uh, something that EPB found when it entered the market in Chattanooga. But as to say that it will necessarily always happen, that's, I can't say that. Um, but even without the current territorial restriction, uh, cost is still a barrier for municipal electric systems uh, when expanding their broadband service. Uh, Morristown Utilities, which again is, is one of the two systems that's authorized to provide broadband outside of its electric service area, has not expanded service um, throughout the en entirety of Hamblin County, even though it's authorized to do so. Uh, Morristown uh, uh, Utilities provides electric service within the city limits of Morristown, 
uh, and its broadband network has been built out to all of its electric customers within the city limits, uh, though of course not all subscribe to the service. Uh, while the utility is authorized to provide throughout Hamblin County, um, outside of its service area, electric service area, uh, the cost of performing make ready work to attach equipment on utility poles is too high, uh, especially in areas that are already developed, uh, and that's according to our interviews with representatives from the utility. Um, moreover, the utility is also reluctant to use bonds backed by city tax taxpayers to finance the expansion of its broadband network out in the county. Uh, and like Morristown, many of the municipal systems in Tennessee that provide broadband have used bonds backed either by uh, revenue from their electric rate payers or uh, by uh, municipal taxpayers to finance their networks. Um, and if broadband revenue isn't enough to make payments on these bonds, of course, electric rate payers or municipal taxpayers uh, would shoulder the risk of repaying them, even if a network is sold potentially. So for example, in Provo, Utah, uh, Provo built uh, a network, the city of Provo built a network for providing wholesale broadband service, uh, but the retail provider that the city partnered with uh, was unable to generate enough revenue for the city to make its debt payments. Um, and as a result, in 2013, Provo sold its network uh, a $39 million network uh, to Google for a dollar, and city taxpayers are still responsible for paying off the nearly $40 million in debt that's related to that system. Um, similarly, in Groton, Connecticut, uh, they built a network for providing retail broadband service, but sold it um, less than 10 years later in uh, 2013 for $550,000. And the $27.5 million in debt remaining after the sale of that network is uh, to be repaid by Groton Utilities, which is the city-owned electric and water utility. Um, those living outside of an electric, um, excuse me, those living outside of an electric system's electric service area um, and outside of its municipal uh, tax jurisdiction don't share in these risks, though uh, they could certainly benefit from an electric system expanding its network. Um, uh, also, uh, utilities can often justify uh, bonds backed by electric rate payers uh, for communications networks inside their electric service areas, at least in part uh, based on the benefits to rate payers um, that can result from communications networks that support management and operation of the electric grid, uh, so so-called smart grid um, capabilities. Uh, the same dual uh, justification doesn't really exist for the municipal utility uh, for using bonds backed by its electric rate payers um, outside of its electric service area. Um, and of course, municipal, uh, municipally owned broadband networks are not immune uh, from the risks that uh, all providers face in a competitive market. Uh, in Tennessee, municipal electric systems in Covington and Memphis both developed broadband networks but later sold them because they could not generate enough revenue. Um, uh, Covington was uh, one of the two municipal electric systems that was authorized to provide uh, broadband outside its electric service area. Uh, and began providing service in 2002 using a general obligation bond to finance construction, um, but the system did not generate enough revenue through cable and internet service and was sold to a private provider in 2007 uh, following uh, a referendum on whether to raise property taxes to support continued operation of the network. In Memphis, um, and I, I mentioned uh, Memphis I think briefly, uh, Memphis Lake Gas and Water partnered with private investors to build a fiber optic network for providing wholesale broadband to retailers that began operation in 2001. Uh, the partnership had difficulty convincing uh, established retail broadband providers to use its network to offer service. So Memphis was the wholesaler and they were looking to attract retail partners, uh, but they had difficulty doing so. And in 2007, the network was sold at a loss of $29 million. Um, now, electric cooperatives um, have helped expand broadband access in rural areas in other states uh, by building their own networks and serving as retail internet service providers. And as nonprofit corporations, electric cooperatives can make a business case for serving areas with lower population densities and therefore uh, lower returns on investment in some cases than for-profit providers. And I will say um, some of these electric cooperatives in other states have relied on significant grant funding, uh, both from the federal, gov uh, from the federal government. Uh, much of that was um, as a result of the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act and so isn't necessarily still available. Uh, but others have also uh, taken advantage of loan programs um, both through um, like telephone cooperatives, uh, they, they also have access to loan programs through the USDA's Rural Utility Service, um, and they also have access uh, through the National Rural Utilities Cooperative Finance Corporation, which is a nonprofit uh, financing cooperative created in 1969 um, that uh, helps to raise funds for electric cooperatives. Um, electric cooperatives, of course, are not currently authorized to provide retail broadband service under state law, uh, and although existing telephone cooperatives are allowed to provide broadband and do uh, in many and, and really all their service territories in many rural areas, uh, and although many smaller private telephone companies also provide service in those areas, uh, their service territories do not extend as far as the state's electric cooperatives. 
um, one option the state could simply uh, authorize electric cooperatives to provide retail broadband service in their electric service areas, uh, but this would require them to build their own central office facilities. Uh, you might, in the cable uh, television parlance, you might hear this referred to as a head end facility. Um, and this could be cost prohibitive for many of the cooperatives. Uh, but uh, another option, a better option, would be to allow the state's electric cooperatives uh, not only to provide retail broadband, but also to partner with existing providers, including uh, municipal providers, to provide broadband service in the cooperative's electric service area, any uh, municipal utilities that would be part of these um, uh, partnerships would not be authorized to issue bonds to fund the construction of broadband networks or broadband assets outside of their electric service areas, but they could use their exist existing central office facilities, their head-end facilities, uh, which in many cases we've been told already have excess capacity um, uh, to help operate the electric cooperatives networks as wholesalers. Uh, electric cooperatives would build and maintain all of the network infrastructure inside their service areas and function as the retail uh, internet service provider. Now, a couple of issues to be aware of with this is that although municipal utilities are authorized to provide telecommunication services outside of their electric service areas, this is under uh, Tennessee uh, Code Annotated Section 752 Part 4, um, wholesale broadband service is not explicitly included in that definition of what a telecommunication service is under state law, and according to a 2014 opinion of the uh, Tennessee Attorney General on whether electric cooperatives could provide retail broadband service, uh, it says that the term telecommunications does not inherently include internet service. Uh, unless the term telecommunications is expressly defined to include internet services, therefore, that term cannot be construed as including such services. So that's to be aware of um, that opinion. Um, now, you might already also be saying, don't we already have a joint venture statute under state law? And the answer is, yes, we do. Uh, Tennessee already has a law authorizing joint ventures, uh, public-private partnerships for providing broadband, though it comes with some restrictions. Uh, so this is found in Tennessee Code Annotated, Section 759.316, and this authorizes local governments, municipal utilities, and cooperatives, including electric cooperatives, to form joint ventures with existing providers uh, to expand coverage. Um, but some of the limitations are that it's, it's only available within unserved areas uh, that have been developed for residential use for at least five years uh, that are outside of uh, the existing cable franchise area for a state or local issued franchisee uh, and which no other provider intends to serve. And according to uh, staff at TRA, no one has as yet set up a joint venture under this law. Um, and again, uh, as I mentioned with municipal utilities, the same uh, disclaimers and caveats apply to uh, partnerships. Uh, they can uh, offer, lo offer local governments a more active role in expanding broadband coverage, but they are not without risk. So Memphis, as I mentioned, uh, uh, was a partnership. It was a partnership between the city's electric system and private investors uh, who helped to build the network. Uh, and it failed in part because it could not sign up retail providers or it had difficulty signing up retail, retail providers to offer service. Um, again, Provo, uh, another example that I mentioned, um, it uh, was a wholesale network. It was set up as a partnership between the city and a retail provider, and it failed because the city's private sector, par uh, private sector partner could not generate enough revenue. Uh, similarly, uh, a partnership involving the town of Monticello, Minnesota, uh, also failed in part because it could not compete with com incumbent providers who were able to lower their rates below cost. Um, The report also makes uh, a few additional recommendations related to coordination and planning. Local planning and coordination uh, with and among existing state agencies is, is really going to be essential for adopting, uh, uh, for improving uh, adoption and increasing access in Tennessee. And uh, from what of our, a lot of what our research has found, especially for adoption, local governments are really best situated to determine their community's needs, especially when it comes to, uh, to those adoption programs. Uh, Connected Tennessee, as I mentioned, has provided assistance to many communities in developing local adoption and access plans, and they did this before their funding uh, ran out. Uh, and community plans uh, can determine, uh, help determine the target populations for adoption, as well as the some of the most appropriate strategies uh, for expanding coverage. So several states uh, have created separate broadband offices uh, to coordinate access and adoption strategies. And while this approach uh, can enable better coordination, it can also create duplication uh, and add complexity to decision making, as well as add to the cost of governing. So uh, fortunately, um, Tennessee, we already have a model. This type of strategic coordination could be accomplished without having to create a new uh, state agency or office. Um, Tennessee could coordinate its broadband efforts using a standing working group uh, made up of state and local officials, representatives for broadband providers, and representatives of the many nonprofit organizations that are working to increase connectivity and use in the state. Uh, an example for such a working group could be 
uh, found uh, in the state's basic education program review committee, um, which meets periodically to help the administration and legislature uh, set education funding priorities. Um, so I think in addition, uh, one more uh, potential option for the state uh, or resource that it has as it's available is its annual infrastructure needs report, uh, which this body of course is familiar with. Um, the state could also include broadband as part of its initial, uh, as part of this uh, annual report and survey. Um, and by reporting broadband as a separate type of infrastructure within the transportation and other utilities category, uh, the state can, can really uh, better calculate what the cost of meeting its broadband infrastructure needs are over the next five years. Um, so I thank you for bearing with me. And um, any additional questions, I'm happy to fumble my way through. Heavy lift, Dr. Owen, thank you. Questions, comments, because from here we go, he goes back and, and make any final revisions for presentation in January. Yes, ma'am. I don't know if this applies, but tomorrow we're gonna hear about the emergency co uh, communications. And I know thinking, uh, looking forward, they're thinking at some point in time in adding text messaging and uh, email notification, uh, voicemail to notifying 911. And without there being total coverage, you know, be, uh, it's available but not ex not taking access to it. Is that going to be something we need to think about and how that impacts the future of 911 communications? You know, I think that's certainly something that we should look at for the final part of the report. I think we should we can reach out to um, the um, emergency. Um, oh, I'm losing their acronym. But yes, we will reach out to them to see what their, their status is. I believe we heard um, from, uh, in way back in October 2015, we heard uh, a report on FirstNet uh, as part of one of our panels. And so I think that's information that uh, was not included in the draft, but that we can uh, certainly include in the final report. Mayor Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a pretty simplistic kind of person. Dr. Owen, if I go all the way back to the first page on tab three <laughs> and read the last sentence of the first paragraph basically said there are already several government and private initiatives to address both broadband access and broadband adoption supporting the recommendation that Tennessee should focus its efforts on supporting and coordinating these existing initiatives and on addressing any remaining coverage and adoption gaps um, so basically if, if I read that in its simplest form you're really telling us enough initiatives, private and otherwise, are in place, and we just need to support those and continue the journey within those that are now available to us. Is that a fair statement, or am I overstating what you've intended to tell us? Well, and I, I think that's one of the things that staff found in our research is that there actually are quite a bit of, uh, of initiatives that are already underway in the state uh, that, with additional support, uh, can be made even more effective. Um, and so once once we've we've done that and sort of established that, I think it, it's sort of similar to the to the CAF uh, to the Connect America Fund and the grant programs. Once we've established um, what initiatives there are and how those can be how we can maximize those opportunities, we can take a closer look at what the gaps are um, uh, for uh, sort of determining what additional state or local action needs to be taken. And that I think could be the benefit of a of a working group uh, to really help coordinate all those efforts. Mayor Bickers. Again, thank you for, for this presentation. I'm still trying to make to wrap my brain a little bit around the TVA's toll attachment rate formula. But as I look at Appendix 3, page 5, am I reading it right that TVA is built in an 8.5% return on investment? As part yes, of that, that that is correct. And so, uh, for for those, this is within um, Appendix Three is, is actually TVA's appendix to their um, uh, to their memo. So the the memo is actually this is in Appendix J within our report. Uh, and I apologize that uh, the the titling on the pages gets a little <laughs> excessive after a while. But yes, so in um, in their own appendix to their memorandum, yes, they uh, they calculate uh, as as part of calculating their fee an eight and a half percent return on investment. Uh, that that is accurate. Yes. at least in the example that they provided as part of their report. Anything further for Dr. Owen? Anything you'd like to see in addition or done differently? I've talked about trying to do some a little more indexing, you know, for because I, I think that what what is in this report will be 
the basis for um, pretty comprehensive legislation. And I think, at least for the legislators, the easier it is to to read, uh, whether through indexing or or um, annotating, you know, the better. And you're well on your way to having done that, which I certainly appreciate. Good job. All right, Dr. Owen, thank you. Yes, Mayor Sander. I still call you Mayor. I know. Okay. I would just like to say that I do not, so I, I need to add a caveat. I do not support or think that it's a good thing going forward that 911 utilize uh, the text messaging or the email. I think that's what we need to be sure that we emphasize that it's a life safety issue, I think, that could be uh, detrimental to the responding in time. But I just thought that we ought to note that that might impact that service and be a reason not to go that way. Thank you. There's another comment that had been made was was about joint economic and community development boards I mean we've talked about uh, working groups of some sort but you you might just consider I don't know whether they would work or not but the Jeds um, there's some changes proposed that that was all under 1101 as well but some of those are entities looking for a, a mission and there might be something there okay yes Senator Yarbrough thank you Mr. Chairman uh, I think uh, First, I mean, this is a remarkable amount of detail in this, and we, we appreciate it. Uh, and I think that I would just want to second what uh, uh, Chairman Norris said, sort of the ability to index and get to uh, some of the key portions. And, and it might actually be useful for us to understand, you know, there, there are several places throughout this report where obviously there are, these are estimates, but it's like, 122 million dollars to do X, and you know, then a different investment won't really have a figure. You know, sort of something that that kind of tries to give us almost a cheat sheet if, or, you know, of like this is the kind of investment that you can get to, you know, uh, to to achieve the you know this level of of uh, penetration. Uh, I mean or at least of the information that's in here. And because I think what it, the other, the reason that it comes to mind is uh, we have that kind of catch-all section of, about ado broadband adoption programs. Like I have no idea how much money we're spending on that. I have no idea like how much, like if you increase that by $50 million, what does anybody have any idea what that means? Um, you know, I, I think it's kind of, it'd be helpful for us as, you know, sort of at the local and state level as policymakers to be able to m understand kind of if we're making, you know, we might know what we would do if we had $10 billion to do this, but assuming that we have a, a, a smaller pool of money, uh, what are, th how do we kind of use use the data in the report to make, make smart decisions uh, about where the trade-offs are or should be? Certainly, and that's, that's something that we can definitely do. We've, um, I, I think for some of the programs, we've tried where possible to, uh, to list what, they, what they've uh, listed as their cost. For example, I think that Nashville's um, Anytime Access uh, program is, uh, is listed as a, a approximately $145 per family uh, for that program. And then there, there are others uh, that are more. There are some that are less. So it's, it's one of those things where we'll, we'll, we'll certainly try to do our best to, to ballpark what we're talking about <laughs> uh, with some of the programs that we highlight. Yeah, Cliff. I would add one caveat, and correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but uh, one of the things we found there were a lot of these programs will have cost information. They don't always necessarily have benefit information, so they don't say what the, what the payoff is of the investment. That, that has been an issue for us when it comes to assessing adoption programs, is that many of them will tell you how many people have uh, taken the program or, or completed uh, training, but they don't then follow up um, to see how many of those people then adopt service uh, either in the short term or the long term. There are several studies that have, but they, they are unfortunately few and far between. So um, unless there's any objection to this, what I'll plan to do is with Dr. Owen, Dr. Lippard, and others uh, communicate the, the, the major findings of this to the administration because by the time we come back to approve the final report, they will probably have already you know, put together their legislative package for uh, the 110th General Assembly, at least the first session. I want to make sure we, we communicate this to Stephen Smith, for example, and others. Has he, has he communicated with you at all about this, Dr. Owen? Not directly, no. Okay. Indirectly? 
uh, we've received communication from certain parties that are involved and in, or that seem to have in, be involved in some of the talks. Yeah. <laughs> like smoke signal. Put it, put it as cryptically as I can. Yeah. Semaphore. You know. I'm pretty good with flag signals. Yeah. yeah uh huh. All right. Well, I'll, without objection, then I'll, I'll sort of <coughs> take that upon myself as somebody who traditionally is involved in carrying that type of legislation, just to see if if uh, they think some of these ideas are as, as good as we might. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Going to move on to tab four. Gets a. Uh, this is the, um, just for review and, and comment, the draft report on court fees and taxes in Tennessee. And Jennifer, there she is. Good afternoon. Yeah. Nope. It was ready for you. I turned it off. And there we go. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. My name is Jennifer Berry. I'm presenting the draft report addressing Tennessee's court fees and taxes for your review and comment this afternoon. And the draft report is behind tab four. <coughs> the report responds to a, a request from Senator John Lundberg, who at the time was the chair of the House Civil Justice Committee to study court fees. In April 2015, Chairman Lundberg sent a letter to the commission writing that several committee members are concerned about the recurring fee increases and asked the commission to review all bills passed in the last 10 years that increased any type of court fee to describe the fees and how they're being used and make recommendations. A copy of the letter is included on Appendix H as Appendix H on page 157. Because many stakeholders that we interviewed talked about the challenges of collecting court costs, the report also includes information about efforts to collect unpaid court costs. In the next few minutes, I'll give you an overview of all the court fees and taxes in Tennessee and their earmarks, and briefly talk about the collection of them and describe a few ideas to consider that might help improve the system. Tennessee's court system is made up of several different types of courts, including municipal courts, county level courts, such as uh, circuit and chancery courts, appellate courts, and the Tennessee Supreme Court. This critical public service depends on and is in part funded by hundreds of court fees and taxes. Some legislators, court clerks, and others that we talk to express concern that if the combined amount of court costs is too high, it would, could limit access to justice in civil cases and create uncollectible court debt, particularly in, in criminal cases. And this concern isn't new. In 1996, the Commission on the Future of the T Tennessee Judicial System wrote in a report that judicial fees, user charges applied to various procedures of the system should be charged to offset in part the expense of operating the system, but should not be so high as to preclude access to the court services. The Conference of State Court Administrators in its 2012 paper titled Courts Are Not Revenue Centers provides several guidelines for a well-balanced system of court finance, including first, courts should be substantially funded from general governmental revenue sources, enabling them to fulfill their constitutional mandates. Court users derive a private benefit from the courts and may be charged reasonable fees, partially to offset the cost of the courts borne by the public at large. Neither courts nor specific court functions should be expected to operate exclusively from proceeds produced by fees and miscellaneous charges. Second, fees and miscellaneous charges cannot pre preclude access to the courts and should be waived for indigent litigants. Third, fees and miscellaneous charges should be simple and easy to understand with fee schedules based on fixed or flat rates and should be codified in one place to facilitate transparency and ease of comprehension. Fourth, optional local fees or miscellaneous charges should not be established. 
And finally, fees and costs, however set, should be determined in consultation with the appropriate judicial body and reviewed periodically to determine if they should be adjusted. Other states also face the issue of rising court costs, but according to the National Center for State Courts, there is a lack of information on the topic. And an analyst from the center said he doesn't know of any other states, of any states that have done well dealing with court fees. Caster staff reviewed other states' fee and tax statutes and found that they are complex and we reviewed studies and none identified any specific states as a good model. Most studies and, ref and reports refer to the principles and guidelines that are recommended by the Center for State Courts and the Conference of State Court Administrators. The General Assembly was able to revise and simplify many court fees and taxes by passing Public Chapter 429 Acts of 2005, which replaced several sets of itemized fees with single flat fees. So rather than charging separate individual fees for each private service, excuse me, for each service provided by the court clerk or action taken by the court, basic flat fee fees are charged for each type of case in each court, except municipal and, and appellate courts, with the intent to cover the costs of that case. The law also amended several, several other sections of code, including statutes with litigation taxes and court clerk commissions. Since 2005, the General Assembly has passed 46 bills that increased or added new court fees or taxes or authorized local governments to impose them, affecting a total of 65 separate fees or taxes. See Appendix G, starting on page 123, for additional information on the legislation. Currently, there are 245 separate court fees and taxes in Tennessee, ranging from 50 cents to $3,000. They vary by the court, type of case, actions taken, and whether they are mandatory, optional, statewide, or county-specific. Optional fees and taxes are either adopted by the local legislative body, charged at the discretion of the court clerk, or at the discretion of the sheriff for those sheriff's fees. Out of the 245 fees and taxes, 104 are fees that apply only to Knox County Civil Circuit, Civil General Sessions, and Chancery Courts. The only courts in the state that do not use the main fee statute. Instead, these Knox County Courts use the itemized fees that are uh, in Section 821-409. These fees are listed in Appendix C, starting on page 67. Of the remaining 141 fees and taxes, 109 are fees and 32 are taxes. 120 apply statewide, while six apply to two or more specific counties, and 15 apply to only one county. 66 apply in criminal cases, 32 in civil cases, and 43 apply to both. 90 are mandatory and 51 are optional. Table 1 on page 13 shows a summary of the 141 fees and taxes. Tasser surveyed all the court clerks in the state, and out of the 105 responding county court clerks, 80 reported collecting at least one of the optional fees or taxes. You can see more detail on each court fee in Appendix D, starting on page 78 and each litigation tax in Appendix E, starting on page 96. Most of these fees and taxes are set in statute by lo or local governments are authorized by statute to levy certain fees and taxes. There are a couple of exceptions. The Tennessee Supreme Court has the authority to set the Supreme Court and intermediate appellate court fees by court order or rule. And municipal courts set their own fees by ordinance, except for a few statutory fees and taxes that are set by the state. In general, civil case costs are less than criminal case costs, but in both types of cases, costs accumulate and beca can become overwhelming, preventing people from filing civil cases or being able to pay the full amount in criminal cases. Figures two and three on pages 14 and 15 show minimum and maximum costs in the hypothetical civil and criminal case. 
that people who can't afford to file a civil case may request that payment be postponed until the end of the case by filing under an oath of poverty and completing an affidavit of indigency to show they are unable to pay the costs. Indigency is not clearly defined in state law, but the Tennessee Supreme Court's Rule 29 provides guidelines for indigency for civil cases, which equal 125% of the federal poverty level. The rule gives discretion to judges and says that the court is not precluded from finding people indigent if they don't meet the guidelines. As a result, there is variation in who is declared indigent across the state. Tasser looked at how other states determine indigency and found that seven states define it in statute. Five of these seven also de define it as receiving public assistance or 125% of the federal poverty level. One state, Minnesota, defines it as being represented by legal aid and 125% of the federal poverty level. And, an, and another state, Arizona, defines it as 150% of the federal poverty level. All seven of these states also give judges discretion to determine indigency differently. In criminal cases in Tennessee, high court costs can lead to overwhelming debt that is hard to collect. Although convicted defendants are responsible for paying court costs, General Sessions, judges, General Sessions Court's judges can suspend court costs and taxes for indigent criminal defendants. In other states, convicted criminals can be sent to jail for not paying court costs, but in Tennessee, people can only be sent to jail if they are, are able to pay the fines, but willfully refuse to do so. According to people that we interviewed, these types of incarcerations are uncommon. During committee discussions, several legislators also expressed concerns about earmarking of court revenue and that fees and taxes are being increased to fund programs that are not related to the courts, even though those programs may be worthwhile good causes. They questioned if it is fair to fund agencies and programs, regardless of their worth, through the court system or if they should be funded through some other mechanism. Addressing the same question in Alabama, a 2014 study by the Public Affairs Research Council of Alabama wrote, it is not appropriate to make the courts into convenient tax collectors for other non-judicial activities where there is no relationship between, between the charge to be paid and the activities to be funded, and between those who pay the charge and those who receive the benefit. <coughs> Of Tennessee's fees and taxes, 86 are earmarked for various programs, funds, and agencies. That's 55 fees and 31 taxes. Of the 55 earmarked fees, 30 are for court purposes only. The other 25 earmarks go to pay for a mix of uses that include county expenses, local law enforcement, probation programs, substance abuse prevention and treatment programs, testing labs, and victims assistance programs. In addition to general court expenses. Nine of the earmarks help fund the Tennessee Bureau of, of Investigations, 12 go to the Department of Safety, and 12 specify the, the state general fund. Table two on page 16 shows the individual earmarks in statute grouped into categories. 31 of the 32 taxes are earmarked. 19 of the earmarked taxes apply statewide and 12 are specific to one or more counties. Many of the taxes provide funds for multiple earmarked purposes. 19 of the taxes partially support the court system, 17 partially support victims assistance programs, and seven partially support substance prevention, substance abuse prevention and treatment. Other tax earmarks include child advocacy, local law enforcement, testing labs, and several earmarks in the varied category, which includes 14 earmarks that are distributed according to statute. The figure four on page 24 shows the distribution of these 14 earmarks that we're calling the varied category, uh, which apply to 11 different state litigation taxes. Tennessee could provide more thorough analysis of court costs and related earmarks through the use of a judicial committee that reviews and makes recommendations on bills proposing to add or increase court costs. Louisiana is an example of a state that does this. It passed a law in 2003 that requires sponsors to submit such bills 
to a committee of the state Supreme Court to determine if it is reasonably related to the operation of the courts or court system and make rec recommendations on the bills to the legislature. In addition to studying fees, taxes, and earmarks, we looked at the collection of court costs. During interviews, many stakeholders and court clerks said that collecting fees and taxes can be difficult, especially in criminal cases. However, there is little collections data available to help determine the scope of the problem. TASA requested collections data in its 2016 survey, but only received data from 20 clerks. According to the most comprehensive and recent collections data available from the AOC from 2012, the collection rate was 72% in civil courts and 30% in criminal courts. The AOC's data is included in Appendix J, starting on page 160. In 2008, the Tennessee Fiscal Review Committee surveyed court clerks about criminal collections rates as part of a study to estimate the revenue derived from criminal fines, and um, only 15 clerks responded. The Fiscal Review Committee staff recommended that the AOC be required to send an annual report of uncollected criminal case assessments from each county to the committee, but the AOC was never actually required to do so. The AOC could be required to send an annual report of uncollected criminal case assessments from each county to the committee. A few other states, including California, Florida, Michigan, and Texas, currently require local courts to report collections data to the state, and studies in Louisiana and Ohio have recommended that local courts there be required to do the same. So to summarize, two, I two ideas to address the issues are, first, to help legislators make decisions about bills brought to them, Tennessee could, like Louisiana, provide more thorough analysis of court costs and related earmarks through the use of a judicial committee that reviews and makes recommendations on bills proposing to add or increase court costs. And second, as a step towards improving collections of court costs, the commission agrees with the Fiscal Review Committee's 2008 recommendation that the AOC could be required to send an annual report of uncollected criminal case assessments from each county to the committee. And I appreciate your input today and we'll be happy to answer your questions. <laughs> Senator Yarbrough. Well, after reviewing your careful presentation and report, my, my response is that this is insane. Right, I mean, uh, <laughs> and we've can <laughs> basically built like one of these co overly complicated Rube Goldberg machines, 245 different fees, 50 of which we've created in the last decade alone, um, uh, and huge amounts of which are never collected. So, I mean, like if you look at the detailed data on this, like if you look at, I looked at one of my, our, our like the Carroll County data, and I'll then I'll give the Davidson County data, to collect $250,000 in criminal fees in Carroll County, we, we impose $1.25 million. So, so uh, a million dollars in debt is passed on to citizens in order for us to collect $250,000. In Davidson County, to collect $9 million uh, out of our court system, we're imposing $45 million in debt. So $36 million in debt that people are walking around with that, that's that's not getting collected uh, to collect nine. Uh, and I'm not saying that like there might be good cause to impose one or two of these or maybe even a couple hundred of these fees, but I mean, this is uh, sort of uh, a, a crazy method of doing things. The, I mean, I, I, d I don't really, I, d I didn't have time to formulate anything beyond sort of surprise and alarm, but um, the, um, you know, one one thing that I wanted to clarify, uh, so on, on the civil side, y there's a big difference between the collection rates on civil and criminal, but I would assume that uh, on the civil side, that's because you, to initiate an action, you have to, to bring, you have to pay the fees. Correct. And then, and I'll defer to uh, some folks that might know better. But uh, then, some of those, some of those fees are then passed along as part, of, wrapped up in, as part of the judgment against a, def a defendant. Would that be correct? 
Yes. So just to say that s even though those those fees are collected on the revenue side for the state, those fees still might not actually might be leading to an exacerbation of debt in our in our communities. Is that fair? Yes. I mean, I've yeah. So it's on the civil side, the the 2012 data showed that the collection rate was about 70 percent, and so some of that is still out there. But well, but uh, what I mean is that even if you're even if, if it's being paid, so if I'm a landlord and sue to evict someone, I'll p I'll pay the fees on the front end, but when the when the circuit when the general sessions or grants me a detainer warrant, part of what they're supposed to pay in addition to the back rent is the fees and court costs and attorney's fees. So that gets lumped in to the yes. To what I, I'm trying to what I'm trying to get at is what's the effect on people, <laughs> right? I mean, I think that there's uh, I mean, a lot of this is how do we increase the revenue side from government or at least make it more predictable and uh, stable. But part of this is how much debt are we creating for 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 the value? I mean, if we if we have to create thirty million dollars of private debt to uh, obtain ten you know ten million dollars of of revenue, w there's that's not necessarily a that's not I'm not sure that's a net gain for the community. Um, and then there's other one other striking figure in here that I at least wanted to bring out. So the driver's license thing that law was passed. When? 2011. So in the last five years, we've revoked almost 200,000 driver's licenses in the state? Correct. And some of those are multiple revocations. So a person might have their license revoked more than once, but yes. Okay. That's just a, just a startling figure. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, Mr. Chairman, I'm not, I'm not sure where to go. Uh, and I, I mean, I think I'm sure that I've, in, uh, voted for a lot of these things, and I'm sure the chairman has, and uh, any other legislators have, have voted for some of these things. But, uh, but, I, you know, I think I don't know how we go about bringing some some order to this. But it seems that this is a place that is in dire need of order. Mayor Vickers, um, as someone who's still actively engaged in the defense of civil actions, um, while the court cost situation is different from the criminal side, it's still a significant issue that I would urge my colleagues in the legislature to take a hard look at. While it's correct that there are some fees that are paid at the time of filing, and there's also a cost bond that is signed to supposedly pay those fees, the vast majority of the fees occur during the during the pendency of the litigation, every time there's a hearing, every time there's a motion filed, every time there's an order filed, every time there is an action of virtually any kind, there's a significant cost fee that attaches. And it's not unusual, and I'll take Knox County, for example, that has a, they really like those fees in Knox County, as you noticed, but it's not unusual for us to get, you know, into a case, sit down and try to resolve that case as we should, and have and be faced with thousands of dollars of court costs. Okay, the typical case, you know, a year and a half in, which is the two years where most of them resolve, you're looking at thousands and thousands of dollars of court costs. It's not unusual for us to be unable to resolve the case because of the amount of court costs. We could look at the damage that someone has suffered and reach an accord on that, but then then we have to look at paying the court costs and then settlement typically becomes simply unreasonable and and we either end up litigating the case and we prevail you think well we don't pay those court costs but that's not the case because typically the court costs are so large the bond that the plaintiff attorney and his client file to cover those costs is insufficient to pay the actual court costs and then what happens is if the clerk can and sometimes does make an effort to collect them from the plaintiff, and I'm speaking to somebody who practices almost exclusively in the representation of those that have been sued, then the courts say, okay, Mr. Vickers, 
your client pays them because the court's position is the litigants pay that cost and if the not if the you know the non prevailing party can't pay them then the prevailing party pays them and so it's while it may not be a significant and it may just and it may be a seventy percent collection rate in civil cases that's often because you know one they're paid when the case gets resolved by the settling party or they're coming back after the prevailing party for the payment of those tort costs so it's something i'm not i won't profess to know what the, the the answer is but i've urged my colleagues in the legislature when you look at that to appreciate that it's not just on the criminal side but we're seeing significant impact on the civil side of litigation as well representative carter thank you mr chairman and and um I see Martin, Representative Daniel, sitting out there, and he and Representative Lumberg and I have screamed at the top of our lungs. Just so that you all know, and particularly Representative Wargo, we have, uh, what year before, I guess the year before you came, uh, Representative Daniel, we had uh, $3 per case filed to put win uh, new windows in a particular courthouse. It never ends. Last year, we had a wonderful presentation from Rutherford County to add $175 per case to create drug courts and rehab. Great things. I mean, nothing wrong with any of these programs, but we have so burdened the system, it's very difficult. This, this came to my knowledge when I found myself in Memphis uh, in a hotel looking for a room a year or so ago and stumbled into the wrong room, and there sat Tom Hatcher, the, pre the, the what do they call him, chairman of the Clerks Association, I guess. And he said, well, thank you for coming. We didn't know you were coming. I said, good Lord, Tom, I staggered into the wrong room. I had no idea you're here. They were discussing this very problem, and that's when not only what had come to us in the short time that we had been there, Representative Daniel, but what has been over the years, and it's become quite a problem. I did have the privilege of trying a lawsuit and luckily winning it in Blount County recently. My last lawsuit ever, I hope I volunteered to help someone. I shouldn't have. But when I got through, I went by to see Tom to thank him for participating in this. They had just settled a case and they got one check for court costs in and of 32 checks out, not one to them. Now, for the mayor, my clerk tells me that in Knoxville, when we went to the, Jennifer, the one billing system mm -hmm. or the flat fee, Hamilton and I think 94 other counties went with that. Knoxville did not. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm telling you what I've been told, not the truth, okay? So if it's wrong, please don't hesitate to correct me. But the problem with that is Hamilton County last year lost five or $600,000. Knoxville made money. Hamilton County lost money. So I got stopped at the Republican Women's Christmas Party Saturday with him screaming, we've got to increase court costs. And I said, oh my gosh, what a terrible time to bring this up. <laughs> so I understand the, the, our clerk in Hamilton County had averaged for the past 10 or so years returning about three hundred dollars to $350,000 in excess fees to the county commission uh, so that taxes did not have to be raised. Last year they were a little short of matching, so the taxpayers literally paid for people to litigate and so I see both sides of that issue I was a civil lawyer so I see the civil side of this incredibly different from the criminal side and the criminal side is where most of these 32 checks have to be written from but we've got to figure out if we're going to let people have access to the courts are they going to be branded forever having done so and and where's that sweet spot uh, I think the courts, the civil courts particularly, should support themselves to all the extents necessary, but when we begin to tag cost after cost after cost onto them, it's just not going to work. In Hamilton County now, you pay a flat 250 is that right, Jennifer, do you know? Is that the statewide fee now, you pay 250 It depends on uh, the court and the type okay. of case. I think it's 225 actually, circuit, okay. yeah. All right, so... Uh, when they did that, of course, they thought they were doing good, that not to have to have all those people charge for everything, keep up with it, generating these bills, very costly, very time consuming. Let's just do a flat fee and we'll actually realize more money. That has not worked out in Hamilton County. I can only speak for, for our county. So literally next year, probably the taxpayers are going to have to subsidize the courts and the clerks 
needs $18.90 increase per cost per case to get back to zero. And I told him we'd be discussing that today and be happy to, uh, to see what we could do. But that's both sides of the issue. And it has really become difficult. It's extremely difficult when you have Rutherford County, whom you love and you want to help, and they've got a great program they're going to put together, and, and it's needed. Oh, what could be more needed? But it's going to add $175 per case when they're not collecting those costs. Finally, the criminal courts in Hamlin County during our last race, it was published that there was, only, there was over $47 million in outstanding court costs in criminal court alone not collected. So that's, a, that's quite a number. So thank you for this. When we talked about sending this to you, uh, I mentioned to John that whoever did this is just going to be cross-eyed by the time they get there because it's extremely difficult. I also felt like we would have clerks that would not want to cooperate fully because here's an elected official admitting that they're not being able to collect everything. So I know this has been like pulling teeth. But it's very valuable. It's a great report. And thank you for such diligence in it. So. We're Mayor. happy to take any suggestions you may have. Mayor Rowland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, referring to Representative Carter's description of staggering into a room, I just wonder if you'd want that word stricken from the record today. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Orgo. Thank you. You alluded to two reports that I listened to, uh, one that you said that you only had 20 of the clerks respond and then that fiscal review had done a study several years back mm -hmm. and maybe 15 or 16 responded. How are we reaching out to these clerks to ask for this as information? Is, is it just a request that's sent and then if they don't reply, it's, it's okay? Or, or can, you, can you help me understand that? What we could do sure. to get them to participate in a better fashion? I'm not sure how that um, fiscal review committee did it in 2008. Um, but we sent out a survey earlier this year, and we which you have a copy of in this report. Yes, right? and we we sent it to everybody's email addresses. So it's an eight-page survey that you asked them to fill right. out. And now a lot of the information um, is hard for the clerks to collect. Uh, it took a lot of time for the ones that did respond to gather the information. So a lot of them worked really hard to pull that together. And um, so I don't know how many actually never received. You could consider the suspending us, their driver's licenses <laughs> if they don't respond. Uh, I guess that, we would, that, that would make up that count go just a little bit higher. It's a little higher than 200,000. <laughs> so AOC has the best data, and they actually, um, two full-time people worked on that for a couple of months, plus their director helped out by calling the clerk's offices to gather that data. And they actually, because of the, they're the AOC, they went into the clerk's offices, their servers, to pull the data out. And that's why the data is the best data we have. All righty then. Yes, Cliff. So um, what I'm hearing, I, I believe, from the members is that they'd like to see a little bit of expansion on the cost, uh, particularly for on the civil side, go into a, a little bit more elaboration on that. Uh, and, that and that we can do. Uh, and may actually be reaching out to a few of you for, for, for some examples on that. Uh, but beyond that, are there any other recommendations beyond the two draft ones we've included in, in this draft report that, that you would like us to include in the final report when we bring it back to you in January? Uh, I'm troubled, as I think we all are, by the numbers of, of driver's license revocations. I mean, you talk about counterproductive. Somebody can't pay, so you're going to deprive them of the means to get to a job to generate the revenue they need to pay. I, I don't know what more we can ask you to do in that regard, but um, I don't know anybody who doesn't think this isn't problematic. I understand the carrot and stick, but with most of those, and I, I don't recall, but most of those I would presume are on the on the criminal side. You know, yes, and, they all are. And, uh, I know that there are a number of legislators looking at that whole arena to begin with. Um, I just um, I just think that's particularly problematic. So if you can give us any additional information or recommendations, that would be helpful. You know, anything further? We'll take this up. We'll, we'll vote on this at our next meeting. Yeah, Senator Yarbrough. 
Thanks, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I, and I concur uh, very much with, uh, with, with the chairman's remarks as to the driver's license issue. Um, and one thought on this is, and I don't, don't know if there's any work that's been done kind of nationally, the as to whether collection rates actually increase if if fines are in a in a lower range, or if you know, or if the collection rate is just sort of static, and so if we want to increase the amount of money coming in, the only thing to do is to increase the numbers. But it seems that a system that has as much unpaid seventy, you know, no one should design a system where seventy percent of it's going to be unpaid, right? I mean. If if we're if we're not if we don't have an, a realist a realistic notion about collecting seventy percent of fees, like I th then maybe we should consider whether some of those fees should be in a different range. And uh, and I don't know what the right way to do that is. It's it's more what's the right way to think through that issue. Good work. It's an eye opener. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Senator Yarbrough, I, I'm very interested in, in your comments on finance in the House. We had an example of my second meeting here four, four years ago now. It only seems like a lifetime. But, um, and that was many of you voted to increase the expungement rate from $50 to $350. The year before at $50, the state had received $11.7 million at $50. They moved it up to 350 in order to get all this necessary money. And the collections through April of that year were $800,000. It had dramatically dropped. Uh, shortly thereafter, a young lady that worked for me for years uh, got a ticket. I went to court with her to take care of it. I went to get it expunged. It was $350. And she said, well, I, I thought you said 50 I said, no, it's gone to 350 She said, just leave it there. And so she would spring for the 50, but she wouldn't spring for the 350. And so that's the only clear example that I know of. But we do reach a point of diminishing returns, as we do with all these things. And I don't know where it is. But anyway, the only specific example that I could give you would be some authority from what uh, they told us at finance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Lippard. Based on both of those observations, one thing we could look at is expanding the, the second recommendation, the one on AOC col uh, requiring them to collect this information and, and perhaps uh, suggesting that that information be used for some type of, of return on the investment, if you will, of the, the, the comparing rates with the collection to see what that sweet spot is between the amount of the rate and the, and, and the collection amount so that at least the legislature then will be have, have better information to make those decisions in the future. Very well. Let's do that. Okay. It's an eye opener. Thank you very much. All You're right. Welcome. We're going to move on to tab five, our last business for today. And Ms. Detch has the report, which I believe recommends doubling the salary of the wow. lieutenant governor and speaker of the Senate. <laughs> so make sure you guys are still awake. <laughs> Thank Legislative you. compensation. Yes, Ms. Detch, you're recognized. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Norris and members yeah. of the commission. Today, today I'm presenting for commission approval the report Legislative Compensation Comparing Tennessee to Contiguous and Peer States, and it can be found in tab five. Uh, we presented the draft report at the August meeting, and in response to your questions and suggestions, We've expanded and verified some of the information from other states, and we've included some recommendations that are bolded in the front part of the report. Um, as you may recall, Senate Joint Resolution 463, which can be found in Appendix A on page 47, requested Tasser to compare Tennessee's legislative pay, legislative salary, and other kinds of expense reimbursements to those of our contiguous states to determine if Tennessee legislators are adequately compensated and fully reimbursed. Based on the characteristics of all 50 states, we also added uh, two more states, Indiana and Louisiana, to the comparison states because of their demographic similarities to Tennessee. As I did in August, um, I would note that the state legislatures themselves, as well as the compensation categories that they use, 
um, are not always the same state to state, and so it's important to use some caution um, when you compare one to the other. Um, <coughs> holding elected office is a voluntary act of public service, but the salaries and the other kinds of compensation should be sufficient to attract qualified candidates that represent a variety of backgrounds and experiences. The compensation of Tennessee's legislators for the 109th General Assembly, which is the one just passed, can be found in Table 1 on page 8. Like most states, Tennessee provides a salary, a district office expense allowance, and reimbursement for travel expenses um, to and from the Capitol and at some other times as approved by the Speaker. Tennessee's legislators may choose, but they're not required, to participate in the state's retirement and insur insurance programs. During the most recent General Assembly, the annual salary for Tennessee's senators and representatives was $20,884. Each member also receives a home office expense allowance of $12,000 per year, which is fully taxable as income. The speakers receive three times the other member's salary and also receive additional home district office amounts. We found that on most aspects of legislative compensation, Tennessee is similar to its comparison states and it falls close to the middle. If Tennessee's 2016 salary and office expenses are combined and compared to that of its 10 peer states, we found that four states were higher, five states were lower, and one state, Virginia, is almost exactly the same. Um, this is illustrated in Table 3 on page 26. We've tried to add some more detail about ways that some other states address legislative travel. Um, in 2014, Tennessee changed its laws to provide lodging reimbursements only to those legislators who live more than 50 miles from the Capitol. Both the senators and the House members that live within 50 miles do not receive a lodging reimbursement, but can receive mileage reimbursements up to four round trips per week during the legislative session. In the interim, the senators can continue to receive the four round trips um, of mileage per week, but House members drop back to one round trip per week. If you look at Table 6 on page 38, it illustrates the effect of the 50-mile rule on two hypothetical legislators. Legislator A, who lives 40 miles from the Capitol, and Legislator B, who lives 60 miles. Although the difference for these two individuals is only 20 miles, Legislati Legislator B receives nearly $6,000 more per year after taxes than Legislator A. The apparent intent of the 50-mile restriction was to eliminate lodging reimbursements to legislators who can travel back to their home at night during the legislative session. Um, but the 50-mile restriction may have unintentionally uh, had some a negative financial effect on those legislators who both live within the 50-mile radius, yet represent large rural districts and have to um, travel uh, more extensively wh when they're at home. These legislators uh, have to drive both greater unreimbursed distances within their districts, and then they also have to pay taxes um, that many other legislators do not. So as a result, we've um, tried to look at this information in a little more detail, and we've found 13 other states that also differentiate their travel reimbursements that based on the place of residence. We found four states that, that like Tennessee, use a 50-mile criterion, but then we found eight other states that use either the capital city's or county's border as that demarcation rather than the 50 miles. Um, the state of Massachusetts provided yet a third model by providing a lump sum or lump sum amounts that range from $10 to $100 per day for lodging, meals, and mileage, depending on the legislator's city of residence and how far it was from the Capitol. We also tried to look at some other ways that uh, states address geographically large rural districts generally. Uh, presently, Tennessee's legislators do not receive any state reimbursements for travel within their districts. Um, but Tennessee could choose to recognize the ad additional expenses that can be incurred for representing those districts by paying a higher home office expense allowance in those districts or adjusting the travel reimbursement in some way. We found that Oregon, for example, pays a graduated home office allowance depending on the, the, the land area of legislators' districts. 
Minnesota addresses this problem by paying additional travel reimbursement to those members whose districts exceed 1,000 square miles. And then Maryland offers a $750 annual allowance for in-district travel, but members may accept or decline it. The report also notes that not all legislators choose to keep the compensation they receive for travel expenses. Uh, some members do choose to return their travel reimbursements to the state, but because our state law says that legislators shall be paid, they still must pay federal taxes on them. Um, we noted two states, Colorado and Wyoming, that allow legislators to decline all or part of the travel re expense reimbursement so that they don't incur the tax liability for reimbursements that they don't wish to receive. Finally, in comparing the methods of setting legislative compensation to other states, we noted that 21 states, including our neighbors, Arkansas and Missouri, have passed laws to designate an entity outside the legislature to review and make res recommendations about legislative compensation. These are described in Table 2 on page 20. Um, these commissions typically are appointed by state officials, such as the governor, the speaker, sometimes the, the chief justices. Some of them prohibit certain people from serving, such as state employees or lobbyists or state or local office holder, office holders. Some require representation of certain groups or those with particular expertise, such as compensation or payroll schemes. In some states, the recommendations of these bodies are binding, uh, while in others they must be approved by the General Assembly, and in still some others they must be rejected by the General Assembly. So instead of the current method of allowing the General Assembly to set its own compensation, Tennessee could establish a similar independent body. Um, our General Assembly considered such legislation in 1997, but it did not pass. This concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Questions for Ms. Detch? Yes, Mayor Rowland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ethel, uh, you mentioned the, I guess for better words, a, a compensation commission that was looked at. Uh, do any of the states have that and how many, and whether, and, and if that commission decides on the salary increase, I understand it would be binding to, it, to the members. Yes, I think if you'll look at the, um, the table, uh, table two on page 20, it lists the states that uh, have such a body and also indicates um, kind of who is on it and what their their authority to enact, um, whether it requires General Assembly approval or whether it's binding. Um, in some cases, the recommendations um, apply unless the General Assembly votes to reject them. There's, there's a variety of different um, systems, I guess, for 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 accepting those, those recommendations. I know that's a tough call for the members, but uh, to me it looks like, uh, from an outsider, uh, it looks like a um, compensation commission that would be binding by, by, the leg by legislation would certainly take a burden off the members. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman McNally. <coughs> Thank you. I recall years ago when we were legislature was debating a salary proposal and I believe it was one by the commission it was one that went from 10 to 15 and I think the commission rep recommended 15 and we decided to go with 12 but at that time uh, Carl Cola had had submitted uh, a, an amendment that would have raised us to 45,000 a year then you would deduct a thousand for every day you were in session <laughs> it it got a few laughs, but didn't pass. Uh, but do any of the uh, general assemblies do the, do any of them have a differential pay for other than speakers for like committee officers and things like that? Yes, sir. They do. Um, some of the states, and I believe we have indicated in here. I I don't remember the exact numbers. Some do do pay their majority and minority leaders more. I believe Arkansas maybe pays the committee chairs more. Some pay the two finance chairs more. Um, there's, there are, uh, it, there, I don't think the majority of states do that, but there are a number of examples that do. Any 
additional questions, further questions? All right, the matter to be considered is approval of the report, and I'll entertain a motion that we do so. Moved by Mayor Rowan, seconded by Mr. McMahon. Properly moved and seconded. Further questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed or abstaining? The report is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you kindly. All right, well, we got through uh, today's agenda and um, look forward to returning tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. to take up tab six, the privilege tax in Tennessee. That's also a final report for approval in the morning, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. If there's nothing further for the good of the order then this afternoon, we will stand in recess till 8.30 a.m. tomorrow. Thank you.